So you guys are over here doing a bunch? Doing yeah, we, we come out for two weeks. We make two months of shows and we go back. Really? Yeah. Just in New York or you go LA, New York? Or? So this one's New York and Nashville. And um, Nashville? Yeah. A lot oh. of Bitcoin people there. I see. And then previously we did uh, Austin. We, there's enough in Austin. Yeah, We oh, did sure. uh, LA and uh, SF and then we did Miami and DC. There's usually we can get 60% of the guests in the location yeah. and the other 40% fly in. It's not a bad gig, is it? We want to do them all in person. I, the, I can't stand. That's what the pandemic fucking ruined everybody because they're like, we'll just do it on Zoom. I'm like, no, can you please come to the studio? And that's that's been, you know, it's oftentimes hard, but I much prefer it. Do you do any remote? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we, we do. Yeah, just yeah. because, you know, people are difficult and there's three of us and... You know, one of the guys was living in San Francisco. Uh, he moved out there to be in the universe of those people. Well, we, so this is why we move around. <laughs> yeah. So we know we can get people in different places. Yeah. And we we can pull certain people on a flight, but we yeah. can't. There's certain people who won't come. Um, I, we're not like Rogan level. You, everyone goes in. Yeah. No, I mean, he flies people to to Austin now, right? Yeah. And everybody, you have to be in Austin. He doesn't do any remotes. No, no. no. But our, like... Eventually, I think I think the next step is we'll have one place in the US and one in the UK. Yeah, yeah. And then ultimately one one place, but it probably yeah. won't be a Bitcoin. Have show. you done Rogan? I haven't done Rogan. Yeah, he's now. I don't think he knows me or gives a fuck about me. He, uh, he's not like a Bitcoin guy. No, and I think he gets. An, I think he. I think he appreciates it, but I don't think he wants to do a Bitcoin show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and and uh, it has to be pretty remedial. And I don't know if you'd want to do that. Right? Well, I I think I actually. So it's funny if you asked all the Bitcoiners who who would you want. Very few people vote for me because most Bitcoiners hate me. You you are a polarizing figure. I've well, noticed this. I'm not yeah. a I'm not a not to me gun toting just, libertarian yeah. Yeah. carnivore. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm you're a vegan Marxist. I'm, 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 I'm British, so I'm uh, I, I like yeah. a, a health yeah. service. Yeah, and, sure. And I yeah. don't, I don't mind a bit of tax. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't want guns. Yeah, because I think they're stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I, they're fun, but they're stupid to have in society. Like, yeah. and they all, a lot of them want a, a society or a world where uh, it's complete anarchy and no yes. government. And I just think that's fucking stupid. Uh, uh, you the, the sort of Peter Thiel universe. Yeah, kind of I, yeah. Well, P, Peter Thiel wants it because he can build the walls. Yes, and that's exactly right. He can buy the tanks, but most yeah. people can't. So I'm, I'm not that guy. And, and you know, some of the things I'm a leftist on. Yeah, yeah, some yeah, of the yeah. I'm, So that pisses people off. Uh, I'm also not super into the technical detail. Yeah. And I think the Bitcoin people out there, they want someone like Michael Saylor on who's going to like go into the detail. But I actually think I would be good on it because I don't want us to talk about Bitcoin for three hours. Yeah. So, but whatever. He, we'll see one day maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm bored by people who think the same thing as me. Yeah. Maybe. I just, I have no, I honestly have no interest. In yes. Like if I wanted to talk to myself, I'd just stay at home. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> you know, I do sometimes, but you know. Well, we uh, we have a subject we need to get into today. What's that? We need to talk about what's going on in Ukraine, Russia. Because like, even though it's a Bitcoin show, right? Yeah. We don't always cover Bitcoin. We cover adjacent subjects. Yeah. And we had we had Scott Horton booked, but we had him booked before the war, didn't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had him booked on, and I just like talking to him. I think he's an interesting he's very guy. very smart guy. I disagree with him on a lot, uh, probably most everything. But he's very, very bright guy. I, I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I, I like him. I've heard him. I yeah. heard a whole series on uh, Tom Wood's show, and I thought he was great. Um so we had him before. I've been on his show. And Listening to Tom Woods will get you yelled at by people in the Bitcoin world, right? Isn't he? Uh, isn't he just a? He's a gold bug, isn't he? Oh no, that's well, Peter. Peter Schiff. I'm thinking. No, Peter Schiff. Fuck that guy. Yeah, he oh, sucks. We forgot yeah. Schiff. We've not got Schiff. We forgot yeah. Schiff. We usually have a picture of Schiff in the background. Have yeah. we got the block clock? We usually have some yeah. ode sh to Schiff. Yeah, he's a jerk off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they love to, they love Tom Woods, um, but he is a libertarian who isn't a full Bitcoin bug yet. Tom Woods. Yeah. Yeah. He's a he's a, a bit on the on the dodgy libertarian end where I, I'm we're not on, so we are on. No, we we're, are. Yeah, we're, we're recording. recording. We're recording now. Oh shit, you can sneak up on me like That's that. the best way to do it. Oh my goodness. I mean it is for you. Probably not for me. I was about to say something. Well, you should <laughs> you should say it. Uh yeah, not my cup of tea, I'll just say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like Tom Wood's show and I listen to it, but I am I am definitely not in agreement with him on a number of issues. 
I should say I don't listen to his show. I, I should if I'm gonna if I'm gonna say bad things. I'll be drawn in on a p- particular guests, but I'm not I'm not in agreement with it because I'm not a libertarian. So what are you politically? Do you have an uh, ideology that you kind of organize your ideas around, or they organize themselves around? Um, I would say I'm a a right leaning progressive with libertarian empathy. So you just covered everything. You yeah. just try. You're designed to confuse well, me. No, no. So in the UK, I, I mean, yeah, I, what would you be in the UK? I'm a conservative. You're a conservative. Yeah, that's the only party I've ever voted for. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I, I get called a lefty a lot in the US, but I think that's because... You're a Tory wet for well, us. No, I think, yeah. do you know what I think it is? I think there is, I think you have the American right yeah. and the rest of the world is left of that. Yeah, for sure. So I'm considered a, uh, you know, a lefty here, but I'm considered a righty in the UK, but it's, it's, it depends on the issue. Like, um, like I would say a classic is it a classic liberal who is uh, fiscally conservative, socially yeah. progressive? I think that's where I am. Uh, yeah. I think um, I think tax is too high and we should have smaller government, but I also like the fact we have a national health service. So something of a Thatcherite, in a way. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. I know that is a dirty word these days, well, particularly in the media class. I mean, I, when Thatcher died, it was really interesting to watch from the outside. Because, um, you know, American conservatives venerate her. They shouldn't because they, there's a lot of things that they would probably disagree with Thatcher on. Um, but th- watching the reaction in the UK was pretty interesting. Well, some people celebrated her because they... Quite, um, quite they, aggressively. They think, <laughs> they think she's a, a Nazi. Like ding dong, the witch is dead, right? That was what was... Uh, didn't they try to make that number one? Wasn't that the number one song? I, some, can't, I can't remember. You might want to fact check that one. There was something, there was some Thatcher-related song that the, the attempt was to make it number one. I'm not sure if they succeeded, but I was like, man, that's a pretty aggressive response to somebody who, you know, I mean, these days, and, and, and particularly, you know, in the world of American conservatives, would be rather mild. They did. It got to number two, now okay. it got number one. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. But the thing, I think the <laughs> difference in the UK is, is you can be politically aligned, uh, but you can, you're, the, like, the, Venn, the, yeah. the circles of the Venn diagram can overlap, yeah. whereas in the US, they, they, they can't touch anymore. Not these days. Every no. topic, your position is one or the other. The polarization of America and the polarization, I think the UK is probably lagging a little behind, thankfully, because obviously nobody wants that. But I think it really has been the culture war issues. Yeah. And when you see people like Ron DeSantis in Florida, um, who I don't think really cares about these things very much, but has a larger stage that he wants to be on, is really exploiting them. You know, I mean, what is the purpose and if somebody say, what is your uh, political ideology? Um, mine has always been effectively anti-communism in like in mm. 1970s and 80s ways. Because I mean, you know, I studied, my, my interest was always Soviet history and the rest of it, not from a place of like, I like these guys, <laughs> quite the opposite. But DeSantis, they passed a bill for a victims of communism day in Florida. And okay. it was part of the, the, the curriculum, school curriculum. Now, this is something that I'm, you know, I'm, I would be in, in, instinctually on that side, but I don't like the exploitation of this stuff for, for political reasons. And people are, I mean, you go to these rallies and people are fist pumping and they know nothing about the issue, but they know what side they're on, you know? It's like the old communist thing was, was you know, uh, tell me where do you stand, you know? Sag mir, wo du stehst, as the Germans said. You know, what, what side are you on? And that's what the culture war has become in the U.S. And I really can't stand it. I really, really don't. Because I'm on the, you know, I'm effectively on the same side as these people in a lot of this stuff, particularly when it comes to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, wokeism, which is, I think, a, a, has been a poison in so many ways. But unfortunately, the people you find arguing the same points as you are not often the people you want to go to a party with or hang around with. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we... But that's in... Fr- I meant that because it's coming to... I mean, I see it in the UK quite a bit too. Yeah, it's happening, but we haven't had the same explosion. And and I think the debate around certain issues isn't so divided. I mean, yeah. like, COVID was a great, great example. Whether you were kind of like pro or anti vaccines had nothing really to do with sure. whether you were conservative or labor. It That's was more, a weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But here, and, and look, I know there were a bunch of Republican people who probably did get vaccinated, but the general yeah. kind of consensus was 
Democrats were, and you know it because you like here in New York, I see a lot more masks. I didn't see fuck all masks yeah, in Austin it's recently. It's really funny, yeah. So uh, it's, a, and, it's a social signal, yeah. Well, yeah. So, uh, but the kind of general pro lockdown, general uh, pro vaccine seems to be very much a uh, democratic side of thing, whereas the, the general kind of skepticism anti was yeah. Republican. That's not a UK thing. There wasn't like it's, conservatives. Yeah, well. and it's kind of not a Europe thing either. Because I mean, the, the thing that I thought was so odd about it was that, you know, Americans were discussing this and blaming, I mean, look, there's, I could go on for five hours about the things you can blame Donald Trump for, who I'm um, very much not a fan of and have a five-year record of not being a fan of. But there was an instinct at a certain point to blame him for everything. Because that means an easy scapegoat. He, he asked for it. But that point when it came to these people who oppose lockdowns and, you know, this is a very uniquely American thing, that was the frame. And I was like, are you guys looking at the riots that are happening in the Netherlands, in France, in Berlin? I mean, Berlin was like a big hotspot of like, you know, rejection of this kind of quote unquote authoritarian regime of COVID lockdowns. And it's like, no, this is not, we put a uniquely American spin on it and we're very good at that. But it's not a uniquely an American phenomenon. And, and of course, prior to COVID, the, it, it, that was the terrain of the left to be vaccine skeptics. It was, that was typically the kind of goop, you know, that, what's, what's her name? What's her name? Gwyneth Paltrow? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of universe of kind of hippie anti-vaccine thing was always considered to be, be something that was specifically found in the left. And God, did that change in the past couple of years. Yeah, I mean, the divisiveness here is really weird. And it's kind of frustrating because you're, it's become so divisive that, again, you get into particular subjects and it's you can't even get to a civil debate about these points now. It's yeah. like you're a cuck or you're a statist yes. or you're a fucking moron, you're an idiot, you've got low IQ. It's like, yeah. you know, can we just even discuss it? Yeah. Like uh, like recently, I'm, I'm quite interested in the Second Amendment. I think it's an interesting topic. I've yeah. read it and... To me, it seems open for interpretation. Yeah, It seems like it doesn't say every person everywhere can have any weapon they want. Hmm. It seems, you know, and I'm trying to have that conversation. Like, and there, of course, are limits on that, too. I mean, you cannot have, an, since the night, late 1930s, an automatic weapon. People think there's automatic weapon. No, there's semi-automatic, and that's legal. But no, we do have limitations on what people can have. But even if you disagree with those limitations, sure. it's like it's it, you want to get to the point of conversation. Well, where is the limitation? Do, can anyone have a nuke or chemical weapons? Yeah. You know, should we put tactical nukes outside schools? And it, it, most rational, I mean, if anyone thinks anyone should have any weapon, they're a fucking idiot in my books. But most rational people have a line. It's like, okay, we agree there's a line, so we agree there should be mm -hmm. rules. Should we have a like little discussion about where that line is and what the impact is? Yeah. I think that people, the, the thing that's interesting about America, and I think it's a, a geography thing too. I mean, you can drive from Brighton to Scotland in what, five hours or something? Something like that? Yeah. Right? Yeah, about yeah. that, right? Um, I drive five hours and I'm in Massachusetts, right? I mean, that's where, that's a contiguous landmass where we're all the same, right? When you get that big, I think the thing that's most interesting is that people in my world of journalism, and this is true, this is the truth that the, the people out there in the, the sort of, you know, what is derisively called flyover country, they're right about this. We have no understanding of them at all. None whatsoever. It's such a curious thing to people. And it goes both ways. It's like the effete liberals who are, you know, everybody's bringing their kids to like trans, uh, you know, readings at the library or something. That's what people actually think. And then you go out there and like, why? There are all these crazy people with guns. It's like, yeah, actually, they're not the problem with the guns. They're actually not, they're not. I mean, they might be the problem politically if you're trying to fight against, you know, the NRA or any lobbies that, that support looser gun laws. But as far as the people that are problematic with guns, I mean, they don't live in Chicago. I mean, there was what, 56 shootings in Chicago last weekend. I mean, it's, well, that was two weeks ago. I haven't, I haven't checked this week because it was Memorial Day. I decided not to look at the Chicago shootings for one week. But, you know, they're generally, that's where it's happening, you know? And when you hear mass shootings, I mean, they're not mostly, you know, kids in schools. They're mostly six people getting shot in gang violence in the south side of Chicago, you know? But so we don't really have an understanding of who the other people are. And then the polarization, look, I think it's better that we don't have three channels for news anymore. I mean, you had that in the UK. I lived in Sweden for a long time. It was only until the 90s that the Swedes had more than three channels, right? Early mm -hmm. 90s. I guess there's regulations against having more channels. We have more now, but good God, does it really set us on these separate paths? 
I mean, there's no doubt about that. You can say it's a good thing or a bad thing. I like more choice. That's another one of my ideologies. Choice is a very good thing. But, you know, people play in their, like, cloistered little corners, uh, you know, and nobody has any interaction with the other people. And that's a problem. I mean, particularly when I go out and talk to people. I mean, I've been to so many Trump rallies just as a journalist. <laughs> And it's just like, these, these people, they're all so nice. Every crew I've ever had, like, they're the nicest people in the world. Everyone's so nice. They try to understand you, but they don't know anything. I went to a Trump rally. I, I loved it. It was fun, wasn't it? Was it was great. I think the people are brilliant. I, I, I love, uh, but I also love a lot of like traditional Southern U.S. culture. Yeah, I, I like country music. I, yeah. I don't like and listen to it, but I like the experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like whiskey. <laughs> I, 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 we're going to Nashville, and I can't fucking wait. It's really um, fun. Yeah, it's actually really uh, fun. Too. Um, yeah. I, I like Republican people. I think they're fucking awesome. Yeah, I don't agree with them on a lot of stuff. Yeah, me too. Yeah, um, and, and I tend to sometimes find I agree with Democrat people on a lot of things politically, but. I also then find I sometimes don't want to spend time with them. There's like this yeah. weird kind of. <laughs> my my ex is uh, is uh, Swedish, and we've came to America the first time is in the mid two thousands, and we're talking to these people at a party in Brooklyn. It was absolutely perfect, and you know she's like you know social democrat, lefty, art school, the rest of it, and we're talking to this woman, and she starts going off about this guy that she was went on a date with or whatever. It was very kind of curb your enthusiasm. And she's like, I found out he was a fucking Republican and like looked at Joanna. And she came back to me and says, I swear to God, she was like, how did he know, she, she know that I wasn't a Republican? Like, why did she just presume that I would agree with this kind of deep hatred, not even a dislike or like, eh, I don't know if I can deal with this. Like, can you believe it? I met somebody like, it's like Eichmann in Jerusalem. <laughs> this is yeah. like a Nazi in a glass box ready to be tried. And she was like, why is that? And I was like, well, you're in Brooklyn. We, we, we're in our little places. We don't, we don't talk to those people or about those people. And she ended up kind of like you. I mean, like really like enjoyed like Southern culture. Cause it was just like hospitable, like politically very different. I mean, I'm sure it's not something that she's, uh, wants to vote based on, but just like you know, w there's a very weird thing in New York that I've always uh, I've always felt at dinner parties. It's always a great place to go, and you know, you I don't say much anymore, but I used to be a total fucking asshole. I'd go in there and like you here. The, the trick is do this: go to a dinner party, and be like yeah, you know, I really can't fucking stand. I had these fucking Christians, and everyone's like, oh, I know. Now just replace that with a different religion. And see if you can get through the dinner party. Like, you know what? I really can't stop fucking stand Muslims. And everyone's just like, excuse me? <laughs> the, 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 you the, say? the You know, the silverware planks on the table, like, get out. It's time for you to go. And it's like, you know, these things, it's, everything is so fraught. And there's just a code that you have to adhere to, whether you know it or not, and whether they know it or not. There's just this kind of natural code for how to exist in certain urban centers in America. And I find it very suffocating sometimes. I mean, it is mirrors some of my views and like the music I listen to, the novels I read, et cetera. I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts for fuck's sake. I mean, this is not alien to me, but I do like getting out from it because people who say, you know, I just really like to travel. I just want to go to different cultures. It's like, you don't want to meet Americans who are different than you. <laughs> but you do want to go to like Swaziland and pretend that like, this is amazing, these different cultures. Like, you don't like that. And that's the thing, that being around people in the U.S. who have different opinions has become such a weird sport because people love to get into it with you too. You do get that in the U.K. though. Like, uh, God, I can't believe I'm bringing this up two interviews in a row. But like... Uh, on Jeremy Corbyn? No, Tinder. <laughs> Oh, wow. You will get people say no Tories. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Tory scum. Yeah, I'm not yes. dating you because yes. you're a Tory. And, yeah. and you can try and explain to them the economic reasons why you're yeah, conservative yeah. and, you know, why some of the policies or someone like Corbyn will completely fail and bankrupt the yeah. country. They don't care. You're Tory scum. So you do get a you do get a bit of that. But I think we benefit from the release valve of not being a two-party system. Yeah, you don't true. have that release valve where you can go, oh, they're being too crazy. I'm just going to vote. You know, yeah. I mean, you kind of are a two-party system, but you, I mean, the Lib Dems exist and then it's a release Brexit valve. party. It's, it's a release valve. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when I was growing up and watching like British comedy and like, you know, stuff that like Ben Elton would produce, people like that, there was a consistent theme of the Tories. I mean, when I was young, I didn't know anything about this stuff. I was like, man, these Tories sound really bad. Mm. These bastards. And like, I mean, there was literally a Rick Mail uh, TV show where he was Alan Bastard. The, who was a Tory MP. It was like murdering. It was just a crazy culture that, you know, 
I don't know what the result was in the UK, but when you have popular culture where that's your party is always considered the kind of, you know, mustache twisting evil, you know, petting a cat and planning some sort of mass murder, how that affects you. I mean, this stuff does drive these culture wars, whether they know it yeah. or not. It's like, yeah, I mean, Tory scum is are two words I know that go together. Well, I'm not British. Well, I think I, I don't think it helps that uh, I think it's it, definitely the last two prime ministers, but a lot of conservative prime ministers went to Eton, which is a highly privileged yeah. school. And Harrow it's, Eton kind yeah, of club. It's that, yeah. That's, yeah. It is that club, and it's that background, and it is that kind of route to success and leadership. Yeah. That doesn't help. I mean, the Tories were that way too. I mean, I, I, my friend Andrew Sullivan, who uh, I'm sure you know, he told me, I think last time we talked, or maybe I think it was on the podcast, that he went to school with Keir Starmer. Like that. I mean, labor has a very similar pedigree in a way, but it's it's being a class trader, which is what you know FDR was. I mean, there's a book about him called Class Trader. I mean, yeah. the idea that you come from unbelievable, almost pornographic wealth, and it's the obligation for you to, you know, turn your nose up at it and reject it. And like the the great kind of example of that in the UK is the Mitford family. We have some that embrace fascism. And Decca Mitford on the other side, moves to America, moves to Oakland, becomes friends with the Black Panthers and becomes a communist. It's like she rejected that class thing. We don't really have that. And I know it's a cliche at this point to say the class things are so different. Um, we, have, we do have it, but it's just on a, very, a much smaller scale. And it means less to people. You know, we don't understand the fact that there are people in the UK who come from, you know, this amazing privilege but have no money. It's an amazing thing to me have crumbling castles and no money. I don't, no one has any idea where the money's coming from at all. It's a very, very British thing, the kind of crumbling castles of the old aristocracy. I, I love it. I don't know about that. That's yeah, true. People have like stately homes that they just can't they keep. They can't keep they, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And no, because you see them come up on right move and you're like, fucking hell, look at this property. And the inside is, yeah. ab- it's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, and it's just people who once had a position where they got things and no one really understood why, <laughs> just kind of, kind of dissipated. And I mean, I know a number of people like this who are, you know, have that plummiest of accents and empty bank accounts. It's amazing. I think that's, I think that's like an old dying part of the UK. It is still, yeah, old yeah. dying part. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't. Feel I mean, like I just that. reference the Mitfords. I'm really not living in the modern age. But I also, th- <laughs> I think that there's like the levels between politicians within Labour and Conservative mm. are coming together. I mean, Keir Starmer, I don't know where he went to school and if he maybe he went to private school, but I, I, it's not Eton, I don't think he went to. I don't think so. Um, and so I think you can... The Bullingdon club types, right? Yeah, I just think I think there's Eton and then there's private schools. Yeah. You know what I mean? And mm. I, I just think it's a, it's a different thing. But we do have that release valve. Like, if the uh, Conservatives are getting a bit too Nazi, you can vote Lib Dem and... <laughs> And if, and if <laughs> that's and, the Nazi relief valve. Well, so, yeah. you, so you've got, yeah, but like, you've got, you've got, you've got like the Nazi uh, type conservatives who are always going to vote conservative, and you've got the communist style Labour people who are always yeah. going to vote Labour. But then you've got the kind of this middle ground. Yeah. And if they do go too Nazi, you go Lib Dems. And if Labour go way too communist, you yeah. go Lib Dems. And and then suddenly you, you the Lib Dems like have the chance to gain some power in government because neither party has enough seats. It yeah. happened recently and. Unfortunately, it was, wasn't good for Lib Dems because you know they gave gave uh, they gave away too much to, to the Conservatives. But at least you have that release valve where you can go. I can't fucking vote for that. Yeah. I I can go in the middle here. You, it's just like here, flip a coin. I, I don't vote. I I I I, I truly don't vote. I, right. I I haven't in a long time. And it, it's it, people don't understand this. It is itself a choice. It's a political choice. Yeah. I'm not failing in my civic responsibility. I am actually, you know, living out my phys- uh, civic responsibility by protesting that I hate both parties and the people that are put up for, I mean, I, I will vote in, um, you know, local elections where it actually matters, you know, but if you are registered in Massachusetts, you register in New York City, what's the point of voting? I, honestly, what's the point? I mean, the, 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 the differences are so large. You're like, well, what if it was down to one vote? And I said, then I would vote. I would know that, I mean, this is not like, I mean, you see these contested places where it's very, very narrow. That's a place to vote. I mean, I lived in DC. These are like fucking Syrian elections. 98% for Bashar al-Assad. I mean, this is, they're like a 98% democratic, it's a one-party state. I mean, what is the point? You know, and particularly, you know, all of these attempts in this country at third parties have usually flailed. And because they kind of a hammerlock on the process and they're going to keep you from, getting on the ballot in certain places. It's a very undemocratic thing. So we're locked into this and we just have to deal with it, unfortunately. How do you think it all plays out there? 
because like this cultural war is not only is it not good for America, yeah. but you kind of like everyone looks to you and, and what happens in America, eventually there's like a lag and it bleeds out to the rest yes. of the world. Yeah, unfortunately. I think it's turning now. Um, the failed attempts at yeah, cancels. The, and, to, to go back to Margaret Thatcher, this lady is for turning. It is, it is time to turn. And, mm. and I think that that's happening. And you see these things that people post. I mean, somebody just posted a screenshot. This is a perennial. It happens every time. Of the Rotten Tomatoes uh, reviews of Ricky Gervais' Uh, new special. Oh, the the classic twelve percent for the critics and ninety eight percent for the viewers kind yeah. of thing, and you know it's a cheap little thing. It's like seven reviewers or something, twelve reviewers, but it does underscore a real issue that there is a disconnect between the people who are the the gatekeepers of culture and those who are the consumers of culture. And when you saw the Netflix thing, and I think this is just one example of how this is turning, and the uh, what is it, Ted. Theranos, I think his name is. Mm. I always want to say Theranos, and then I think that's <laughs> that scam company, right? Uh, Ted Theranos. He was like, fuck you people. You don't want to work here? Work somewhere else. You don't have a right. It's not a public works project. You don't have a right to work here. But that's very different than some of the previous iterations of the same conversation. Same thing happened at Spotify with Joe Rogan. And I was getting some information from some people there that were like, this is totally insane. And, you know, Netflix, I think, fired a bunch of those people that were in that universe that believe that the workplace is a place to fight cultural wars. And this is, I think, a, a, an absolute result of the change in university culture because so many of these people yeah. are young and, and they're coming out swinging and, and they're not saying, let's lick our wounds, we lost this battle. They are outraged that they're losing it. Like, how, fuck you, you guys are trying to kill me. This is language that's going to murder me. That kind of stuff is so extreme and so wild that when normal people start, when it starts infiltrating the normal culture, kind of seeps into the groundwater, people start calling it what it is, insanity. I mean, the, the fights are much harder when they're just in these little words, worlds of like Twitter and, you know, podcasts and people. But when it starts, I mean, that's the thing that I don't like the tactic, but you got to give DeSantis credit if you want to. He's fighting that battle publicly for very, I think, sleazy political reasons. But once it does get into the culture, people are like, wait, and I think the real issue in that is the one that I never talk about, never talk about in the podcast, is the is the trans stuff. Just because I do talk to people about, you know, like oh, who cares about Leah Thomas or whatever the swimmer and Penn? Well, I don't really, but I think a lot of people see that as the culture changing in a way that they don't like. You know, I mean, National Review, the conservative magazine, when William F. Buckley started in the early 1950s, 54, 55, in their in their mission statement, there was a very famous sentence. He said that National Review is standing athwart history, yelling stop. And that's what people feel right now. They're standing athwart what's happening and they want to yell stop. Because, you know, uh, this is not an ethnic thing. I mean, I did a piece for Vice in um, Starr County in um, Texas. It swung pretty hard towards Trump. It's the most Hispanic district in America, 98%, 99%. And I met all these MAGA people that were Mexican-Americans. And the interesting thing is they're, we, I say we, educated white liberals, put it that way. We love these categories. We're not supposed to say black people are this way, white people are that way, Hispanic. That's bad. But we, we do get it. We get to do that. And we say Hispanics, Latinx people think a particular way. And then they run up against what's happening in Texas. And they're like, what the fuck is going on here? It's like, what? Well, just go down and talk to them. I mean, because a lot of immigrants, first, second generation, are bring up the drawbridge immigrants. They're like, we're good. We don't want those people from Central America. Mm, not so good on the Ecuador stuff. Mm, maybe not from El Salvador, a lot of gangs there. These are the people I talk to. And like we in the media talk about race incessantly, identity incessantly. The rest of the country doesn't. And if they do, they talk about it in a very different way. And it's, it's particularly when it comes to Hispanic. I mean, good God. I mean, Peruvians are the same as Mexicans, are the same as Cubans. I mean, good Lord, you put these people in the same room, they might fight each other to the death. They have very different attitudes about what the world is, but they've been flattened by people who at the same breath tell you not to make broad statements about racial groups and then do the same thing. Because, you know, it's a good way of doing it rather than a negative stereotype. 
all this stuff is stupid. And and you can see it in just the responses for people in polls and in elections. It's kind of insane. I mean, that was a big lead up for us to talk about Ukraine and Russia as well. Yeah, they don't like <laughs> each other very much either. <laughs> well, listen, this this is the They're reason. The Hispanics of Europe. <laughs> But this is the reason. Take that out of context. We, someone put you in touch with me on Twitter because, mm. um, like I said, I had Scott yeah. on. I like Scott. Yeah, I think he's interesting. I do too. Yeah, and the timing was such that we had him booked. He turned up, and a war had just broken out. And he's an anti-war <laughs> guy. And I was like, "Well, look, I, I don't feel like I can, I, yeah. I can miss this opportunity to talk to you." So we, you know, we had the conversation. Unfortunately, his uh, knowledge and recall of history. It's way beyond mine because yeah. he's an anti-war guy. He's yeah, studied yeah, every yeah, part yeah, sure. of this. I haven't. Yeah. I have to go with my vague assumptions of, okay, well, you know, Russia's authoritarian. You know, mm -hmm. Putin likes to put bullets in the back of people's heads and you know, assassinate people in the UK. Yeah. He seems to invade in a sovereign country. That to me looks pretty bad. Bad guy. Yeah, yeah bad guy. Uh, a bunch of people are being displaced. It's a humanitarian disaster. People sure. are dying. I feel pretty comfortable with those statements. Yes. Uh, Maybe tweeting some things out saying, yeah, no, no, why are people simping for Putin? He's a fucking dictator, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And then the reactions come in. No, this is NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is provocation. I, I didn't feel that we we're at the point where. Yeah, Ukraine, by the way, is not in NATO. I, think. I know, I know. <laughs> yes, I know, but I always but, like but, to point that out to people who are saying that. Well, yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. they were saying they wanted to join, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, they've been wanting to join since 1991. Yeah. It's a long time ago, yeah. But what I'm saying is there are the people saying it is provocation, and then there's uh, there's people talking about Nazi battalions, which mm -hmm. seem to be a, an issue, but a small it, issue. It, it, it is real, yeah. It is for real. Sure, for sure. And yeah. then corruption in Ukraine. and it's Also like, real, yeah. Yeah, so all this stuff was coming up, but I was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure there's Nazis in every country in the world. I mean, the head of the Wagner, the Wagner group, uh, the Russian, yeah. it's called Wagner for what reason? Because of Richard Wagner, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, composer. Uh, he, the, the guy, one of the guys that started it has a SS tattoo on his neck. Right, okay. And he's Russian and they're serving, um, not serving the people of Eastern Congo right now, for instance, one of many places, Syria, et cetera. So yeah, it's a, th it's a thing that exists a lot of places. Yeah. But, the, but there's also, cor there's clear corruption in Russia. I mean, it, <laughs> Uh, P Putin's entire base was built on corruption yes. and, and rewarding the oligarchs for yeah. you know, yada yada. It's a kleptocracy so, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so I'm like, okay, so these these exist in both, but there seems to be a reason. The group of people are one way. Group, it's the culture war again. Yeah, it's absolutely the culture war. But in my mind, I still can't get my my head beyond the point that there seems to be an unnecessary invasion of a sovereign country. Yes. Whatever, eight million people displaced, whatever it is now, complete destruction of cities, people being killed, certainly war crimes happening. How are some people not seeing that for what it is? But I spoke to Scott, and in the end of it, I was like, well, I, I, I can't argue back because mm -hmm. I don't understand these topics as much as you. And then somebody tagged me in a post, said, You talk to Michael. And here we are. Well, thank you, whoever that person is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, where do you begin with that? I mean, all of those things are bad things. And um, none of those things allow a country to invade and violate the sovereignty of a neighboring country. Um, there are treaties in place, uh, you know, the Budapest Memorandum, 1994, where Russia agreed to the, you know, abide by the sovereignty of Ukraine. Because Ukraine, after, after the fall of the, the, the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, became, I think, the third largest nuclear power in the country, because they were all based there. Keeping in, keeping in mind Chernobyl's and, and Ukraine. And that was part of the deal of the disarmament was to, was to um, okay, we'll, we'll hand these over and you grant us our sovereignty. The NATO expansion thing has been a line that we've heard um, since NATO expansion. There was, some, you know, oh, they said not an inch to the east. I mean, none of this was codified, by the way. Here, here's the thing that's interesting about this. When you have these things, you say you won't do X, and there's large diplomacy at stake, you codify them into treaties, into agreements, et cetera. None, there's none of that, right? And as if to prove the point that NATO is necessary, the Russians invaded two countries in the region, both of which had NATO aspirations but were not members of NATO, for the very reason that was demonstrated when they were both invaded, and that's Georgia. And I was in Georgia right after that, that invasion in Gori, and um, that is Ukraine. 
so why are, now is this backfiring on Putin? And for the people who think NATO is such a horrible, malign influence, um, oh, it's not a defense. It is, it is a defensive thing. We can talk about Libya and stuff like that. But, you know, in this region, they're not invading anyone, right? Um, you know, the Warsaw Pact, this is, NATO was created as a, as a counterweight to the Warsaw Pact. And as somebody said, and I can't take credit for it, the Warsaw Pact is the only uh, pact that invaded, the only invasions it did were two of its own countries. It invaded Hungary and Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and so Warsaw Pact is invading people within its own space for, for, you know, showing some sort of independence in 1956 and 68. But that said is that, you know, Finland, Sweden, I lived in Sweden. That was a debate that has been, I mean, Swedes were opposed to NATO, uh, you know, being a member of NATO. And for the first time ever since the late 40s, over 50% of respondents and polls in both Sweden and Finland wanted to join NATO. And now they're in the process of doing that. And they're negotiating with Turkey, who is trying to use this as a political uh, way, a country that shouldn't be in NATO, by the way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, th th this is a pretty obvious thing. You don't want to be invaded and you want to join an alliance of people that will have your back. There's nothing complicated about this. Ukraine has been threatened from the very, very beginning of the Russian Federation at the end of the Cold War in 1991. Um, you know, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, a, a guy of the, the unfortunately named Liberal Democratic Party who died about a month ago, had made a career out of threatening Ukraine and saying it should be taken back into, into Mother Russia. Um, you can have these conversations and arguments about whether historically, you know, Crimea, you know, is, 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 and of course, uh, Putin talks about, you know, he's upset at Khrushchev for, for Crimea and giving it away to the Ukrainians. Okay, fine. You don't invade them, though. You have these conversations in the, with the proper channels, invading them in a way that is so destructive. And the destruction that I saw when I was in Ukraine is is a horror. I mean, it's unbelievable that this is happening in 2022 in Europe. I mean, the defense of this has shifted from a defense of Putin. I mean, they all claim that they're not sycophants of Putin, though I've met a number who actually are, um, particularly, by the way, conservatives, like, you know, Catholic um, conservatives, national conservatives, they call themselves that they love that Putin pushes back and on, you know, the trans stuff. And he made, you know, he made a comment at the beginning of the war about, you know, you in the West, you have all trans rights and all this stuff. And like all the people that you want on your side are like salvaging, like, see, he's one of us, he's one of us. It's a very easy, silly thing to do. But yeah, I don't understand how at this point, I mean, because well, look, I'll say this, the conversation has shifted to, should we supply the Ukrainians with arms? And how much? And are we risking World War III? That's the thing. You know, yeah. Ad infinitum, World War III, World War III. Um, well, we're not risking World War III. They are. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. You don't inv invade Ukraine. None of this happens. But I don't know how the Russians who couldn't take Kiev are going to successfully launch World War III. And with what allies? Not a lot of people that are on their side, except the Syrians. Um, and they're thankful because the Russians came in and, and uh, turned a bunch of parts of Syria into parking lots. Um, a massive series of war crimes that nobody paid attention to at the time, by the way. And we didn't pay much attention to Georgia either. And there's been this, I mean, w where does Putin get this idea? Nobody stops him. Nobody stops him. And I think he, he underestimated the Ukrainian response and the European response and the American response too. Um, particularly Poland, you know, which had been kind of squishy on how they treated, treated Moscow. Uh, not now. I mean, it's, it, the Poles are, you know, ready to to fight. Uh, and, you know, I, the number of people who have joined the army has increased by like 20, 30 percent. I mean, they're on, they're on war footing, uh, really war footing in, in, in Poland. When, you know. when were you last there? So I was there, I think probably f three weeks in, four weeks in, something like that. Okay. Yeah, refugees were still streaming out. I mean, now they're going back. And, and what parts did you travel to? So we were in, started in Poland uh -huh. and around the border. And then we were in Lviv and then north of Lviv. And then we were supposed to go to, um, I had a crew. Um, we were supposed to go to a um, uh, training facility, um, waking up in the next morning to go to this training facility. And the air raid siren we heard the previous night uh, was because the facility had been hit. 
and <laughs> 35 people, um, some of whom were with the unit that we were with the previous previous day, which is an international unit. Um, there were some Brits and Americans, but there were a lot of Poles, you know, uh, Balkan, uh, not Balkan, um, Baltic people. People who, you know, have a, a long history of, of uh, Russian aggression. And so they, it's the kind that they're going there to find. And that's a really interesting thing. Poles are there to fight. Estonians are there to fight. I mean, the, the second largest for the first, I think, month of the war after the U.S. supplier of weapons, money, and materiel to Ukraine was Estonia. That's incredible because that's a country at risk because it's... 1.4 million or something like that. But also geographically. It, has, it shares a border with Russia yeah. and it also has a very large Russian-speaking minority, uh, which is usually what happens. You know, in 1939, the Germans invaded Poland with the excuse of you know, Danzig, you know, Gdansk, you know, which they, this is German. I mean, there's a lot of other excuses, but ethnic Germans, Volksdeutsch, they called them. The same thing is true in Czechoslovakia. You know, those are those ethnic Germans there. The, the Russians do that too, right? I mean, this is like we have, there are people who speak Russian. Well, yeah, why are there people who speak Russian in Ukraine? <laughs> because when you occupy Ukraine, sometimes people go and live there and, you know, remain there and keep their language and they should be treated fairly. And, and there wasn't a huge a bit of evidence that they were being treated horribly unfairly either. It's like there was no genocide of people. I mean, the war has been going on in the in the Donbass region since 2014. But yeah, I mean, it, it's as far as morally, I don't think that there's a convincing argument that um, what the Russians have done is defensible in any way. In any way. I mean, I, I find it completely impossible. Well, you should respect their sovereignty. Well, they're a sovereign com country. If they want to join NATO, it's their fucking business, right? How, why does a big bully neighbor get to, to uh, tell them what, they, what, what they're allowed to do? Uh, they shouldn't, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's madness to say. And then, of course, when they make noises, they want that. And it's usually, I mean, the 2014 revolution, was, it was in, they were turning away from Europe, and people were very upset about that because a promise was broken that they would be a more European-facing country and not a Russian-facing country. It's, it's an absolute losing proposition with a sclerotic economy and, a, you know, what was then a kind of semi-authoritarian country, which is now a, a full-on dictatorship. At the, at, the, at the moment. And don't let anyone tell you differently. It's a dictatorship. What, what was the scale of the, the destruction you actually saw? I, I, I didn't know. So f for me, uh, we were trying to go places that made it difficult. And I am not a journalist that likes to go um, take pictures in front of burned out tanks. What we were doing was we were doing a story on foreign fighters. Okay. And the foreign fighters were coming in through Poland and the points with where they were being dispersed was from Lviv. And, you know, I have wanted to go back, um, particularly to, to Kiev, which is now um, liberated and uh, not quite back to the way it was, but uh, there's a lot of people there and it's, there's traffic jams. And I've been talking to people there that I, that I know that's getting, getting closer to what it looked like prior to the war. But as far as uh, the destruction, I mean, the destruction that I saw was being at the train station, shooting at the train station, by the way, and being stopped by... Um, what we presumed were members of the secret police uh, that gave us a really, really hard time. Really hard time. Uh, and they said, you know, why were you in Crimea? You were, you were filming in Crimea. It's like, no, we weren't filming in Crimea. And I think they saw that it was Vice and that Vice had done something. But they were like, we're going to detain you kind of thing. And it was a pretty dodgy moment. Like, there was a, we had a Ukrainian guy there that was like arguing on our behalf. But, you know, it's it, it was a very tense atmosphere. Of course, there's... There's security checkpoints everywhere. But that was, I mean, th the scale of the destruction you see in a human way of a train station full of women and children, no men. There's some men saying goodbye. And there's old men, too. But it's just people trying to pack on trains to get out that night. And there are people that were left there. And you go back the next night, and it's just, it's just a massive humanity. And it's really, really the most depressing thing I've ever seen. Children crying, people, I mean, we shot this guy who was you know, was inconsolable with his, you know, I mean, literally in, you know, which seems like a Hollywood thing of like touching the glass of the train uh, for his little daughter. And they were going to Denmark and he was staying uh, to join the military because he was they're forbidden from leaving. 18 to 60, you can't yeah, leave. Yeah, you can't leave, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, seeing that scale and then being on the border too and, and, and seeing people try to get out was horrible, you know? Um and we went to a few soldiers' funerals in kind of places that were, we were the only one media there because it was far off and friends of friends knew people a couple hours, I think, north of, of um, Lviv and somebody that was killed in Luhansk. 
and the entire town came out and it was it was a real horror to see and how serious is or what is the scale of this azos nazi battalion yeah. thing and because uh, uh you know majid he's a british uh, journalist he was on lbc oh uh nawaz yeah so uh, he was um he was on the rogan show recently i thought he was interesting did a good show yeah. um but he's, he's got a little around the bend that one well, his Twitter feed for a good couple of months was very yeah. much focused on these yes. Nazi battalions. And uh, I just don't know how relevant that was and no. whether that was some kind of unnecessary misdirection to what was actually happening. Partially. I think that I think it's taking, I think that in, in, in the spirit of honesty, I mean, you have to say that the Azov battalion was founded and it has the sort of what is it the wolf's angel kind yeah. of uh, thing which they just changed by the way um to the derision uh, d derision of so many people who are who are like tracking this and you know obsessed with azov the thing about azov is that is that there are certainly nazis in it there are nazis in ukraine um i saw a guy who had a patch on a, at the uh, train station and I said, you know, what's that patch? And he's like, you don't want to know. And I was like, I think I already do know. <laughs> and, you know, so that stuff you actually see. And that is that is real. But there is a party in Ukraine that um, reflects those views. And I believe it's called Svoboda, which is freedom in Ukraine and Russian. And um, it doesn't break 1%. It, they don't get into parliament. They're not a popular party. Are there people in those military? Yeah, they're foreigners too. I mean, I did a piece for the Daily Beast a long time ago to a Swede. Um, who had gone to Ukraine to fight, um, who was a neo-Nazi, um, notorious in Sweden. And so, yeah, they, they exist. The thing about it, though, is that Azov has gotten bigger, uh, much bigger, um, and they are more than that now. I don't doubt in any way that there's still a lot of these scumbags in there. But, you know, you are talking about, and again, this sounds like the cliche response, but we're talking about a Jewish president of a of a country mm. <laughs> this is you know they're, they're also very good fighters this is everybody that i talked to said the exact same thing it's a lot of military military people they're like they're our best and they're totally fucking fearless and they have the experience because they've been fighting since 2014. that's where they you know after crimea that's where they they were organized after that so they have a lot of battlefield experience and yeah they're they're letting them fight i don't believe though that it is a reflection of Ukraine as a country mm. that is some sort of incipient Nazi Fourth Reich or something that is run by a Jewish prime minister. It strikes me as rather like insincere, but it is important to point out that that de definitely did start as a far right, a far right um, uh, battalion. And but I think it's a lot more than that now. Have you dug into much about opinion within Russia? Um, I bring it up. I have a, a friend who's married to a Russian lady. Yeah discusses widely with him he travels to russia regularly with her but after the war started uh the they had a phone call with the, the girl's mother and her view was very much uh yes we are uh protecting yeah. uh, putin's protecting russia from an invasion of mm -hmm. expansion of uh of uh f uh, nazis mm -hmm. and she fully believed this mm -hmm. um have you dug much into like a little bit yeah understanding because i know there yeah. are people in in russia who vehemently anti this war. I saw a video recently yeah. of a concert where people were protesting against it. Yes. But is this like an age demographic yeah. thing? Is 100%. It like, yeah. So it's the youth get, this is bullshit. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I was in Venezuela once and, and they had, the Chavez government at that point had shut down all the newspapers, right? All the, the opposition newspapers. There was one remaining. And they said like, well, you know, there's the internet. And it's like, well, no, the Chavistas know exactly what the, the Putinistas know in the Kremlin, is that after over a certain age, people are getting the news where they always got it, from television. And that is a thing. If you, I mean, all, there is no independent television in Russia. There was Rain TV, and that was shut down at shut the beginning down, yeah. of the beginning of the, and, and Echo Moscow, Echo Moscow, the radio station, that was shut down too. So that's when you're in a full dictatorship at this point. There is no, if you cannot go out and say, I think this war is garbage, and I think that is, uh, you're lying, all false pretenses, and we're killing our young, and the rest of it. And, and, and remember here, the high count, and this is from the Ukrainians, you can't trust this, is 30,000. But we have a lot of stuff from Russians themselves that put this number 
at around 15, this is the, I think the, the um, UN has estimated 15,000. What's the size of the army? Is it 180,000? Oh, I don't know the actual size of the army because it's it's unclear now because we're trying to figure out with conscripts and right, you know, okay, pulling yeah. people in. But it, the better, uh, you know, example is that there was a conflict that essentially brought, helped bring down the Soviet Union. And that was the idiotic invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, ultimately until Gorbachev negotiated that pull. 15,000 people died in that entire war. Right. We're talking about a couple months here. And so you would imagine there's a point, which is why you control the information. There, when you have 15,000 people whose father died, whose you know, you know, son was killed in the war, et cetera, that backlash is inevitable. It's going to start, and you're seeing it in small places. But as far as like controlling information, I mean, if you, if you dare to call Russia anything but a dictatorship, I fear you're, you know, a friend of mine had to escape Russia under the cover of night to let, dress as a delivery person to get out of her apartment, dressed as like a, you know, an Uber Eats kind of like, because they were, they were being monitored and they left. This is not a country you want to live in, right? And, and, and it, particularly when it comes to newspapers, there's no newspapers left. There was Novoya Gazeta and that's gone. That is now gone. And they went online and they said, if you, if you refer to it as a war and not the special operation, you'll be shut down. The editor of that paper, who won a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, was attacked, uh, paint thrown on him. And Well, isn't it like a 10-year prison sentence for calling it a war? 15, I think. 15 yeah. for calling yeah, it a for war. For calling it a war, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, this is, these, this is not a, a government who's too confident in its own foreign policy when you have to throw people in jail. I mean, this is, in a way, kind of worse than what happened in the Soviet Union during the Afghan war because, you know, at least after you know, Brezhnev and drop off Chernyenko. And then you have the Gorbachev period where things are opening up and people are protesting more, more openly. Old stuff like Solzhenitsyn is being published. And then that war is happening and people are speaking out against it. Now, if you do that in Russia, you're, you're, you're in for a, for a pile of trouble. I once had a conversation, was yelled, not yelled at, but he gave me a sharp rebuke with uh, Gary Kasparov when I said something about uh, public opinion. And he said, no, there's no public opinion. You don't know. You cannot get good answer in Russia. You have no idea. And I was like, yeah, fair enough. And he went and explained, you yeah. know, the nerves that people would have even responding to polling. And that's gotten a lot worse now, particularly in, in like a war footing when, you know, it is the net, the, the kind of dichotomy is somebody who um, supports Mother Russia and its fight against Nazis because the Great Patriotic War was a fight against Nazis. Uh, before, by the way, that it was an alliance with the Nazis yeah. and became a fight against the Nazis. You're doing that again. You're, you're a traitor. Um, and that's that's pretty much the only option, right? You're either a supporter or a traitor. So, I mean, yeah, I, it's 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 a bad it's a bad thing. And I've I've spoken to people, an, an older woman, one older woman in particular, who um, gets her news from TV One, and and they they just can't imagine that people would lie to them like that. I get that in a way. Can, but can can the youth get the news from their phones? They can do they have VPNs. Yeah, they do. And like VPNs are banned. Obviously, in Russia, you right. can't legally have a VPN. And when you go to Russia. There are no Russian VPNs. I mean, I used a VPN when I was in Russia. They told me to burner phone the VPN, and yeah, there's no there's no Russian IP addresses. I mean, it's all neighboring countries and stuff. You're not allowed to to, to use VPN. Always a bad sign too when you're not allowed to use VPN. Iran, China, Russia. You know, these are these are not nice places. Do you think it's fair when people uh, criticize the fact that there seems to be a large international support for Ukraine, mm. whether it's <laughs> Eurovision or yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. Uh, supply of weapons or yeah. raising money. Yeah, Yemen has been ignored for years. Yeah. I kind of do. Yeah. I, I probably disagree the, on this uh, slightly. Okay. Um, I think you're right in the sense that people should pay more attention to this other stuff. I think the way that people process this stuff is they're not thinking about it, right? But what they are kind of understanding is that when they see a place like Yemen, there's an expectation. Yeah, sure, it's people look like you. That, that, that is, yeah, they dress like you, they look like you, they listen to the same music, they go see football matches, et cetera. That is an echo with people. But, it, but it's also when a bomb blows up in Beirut, do you pay more attention to that or the bomb in the same day that, blow, that goes, uh, blows up in Glasgow? You don't Glasgow, expect it. You don't expect it. Yeah, that. and that's the thing with Yemen is that it's a long protracted war. And I'm not saying this is the right way of looking at it. I'm just saying that people do have an attitude that in that region, there is a very uh, recent, shall we say, tendency towards conflict. And so um, 
in Ukraine, which, you know, particularly if you go to somebody like Lviv or something, it, it, you know, it looks like Paris. I mean, it's this beautiful, very European looking. We've all been to European capitals. I think that is the resonance. When people inject race into that, that is because we don't care about the brown people. I don't buy that. And, you know, you can't say that there aren't people who think that way. Maybe there are. I can't, I can't say that there aren't. But I would say that overwhelmingly that instinct also, but it also has to do with, with the fact that the Ukrainians are incredibly good at propaganda. And I don't think propaganda is a pejorative term. I just think it's a descriptive no, term. Yeah. Very, very, very good at it. You know, you could just watch certain channels and Twitter feeds and think that the Ukrainians are winning. And they were in the north of the country, but not right now in the east of the country. But they did a great job of, you know, ringing that kind of moral bell that says, come and help and support us. So I think that that response is, is understandable. But I don't think that we should we should ignore the other, the other countries that are going through this stuff. Well, that uh, using propaganda as a pejorative term, that's a really interesting point yeah. because... Uh, I see. I saw a lot of criticism. It's like, well, yeah. this is just propaganda. They're not yeah. really winning the war. What it's the fuck almost, do you want them to do? It's almost like disgust. It's like, yeah, but hold on. It's a, yeah. it's a tool. You yeah, know, you know, you've got you to know, give hope. Yeah, yeah, you know, Coca-Cola is trying to sell its product, right? Yeah. They're going to have an ad where it makes it look really delicious. The job of Zelensky and the government in Kiev is to sound the alarm that their country is, because they're a smaller, weaker country, they need people's support, and they did a great job of, of galvanizing the world. And that, and that is both with weapons, and, you know, we can talk about that, of whether that's a, a, a good idea. And I'm mixed on that, of like $40 billion from, from the U.S. government. But um, I do believe that they should be supported, for sure. Um, and I think there's no doubt in my mind that the uh, Zelensky regime is responsible for getting people on the battlefield from the UK, saying immediately, we're, we're, we have international brigades, come and sign up and we'll take care of you. You know, and I talked to a lot of these people and a lot of them were professionals. I talked to a British guy from the Isle of Wight who had been there since 2014. He's like, now I'm, I'm relocating from the Luhansk, uh, Donetsk region and, and coming up here to fight. There's been some heavy criticism towards Zelensky. Uh, yeah. To the point where certain... I would say more independent uh, uh, podcasters slash Twitter people who refer to. I can think of one, <laughs> Michael Tracy. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, maybe yeah. I wasn't thinking of him. He's gonna, we've had him on our podcast. He's he, he's going to come back. He said he'd come back. Talk but, to me about. but they've referred to him as evil. Uh, that's would, wrong. I think yeah, that's wrong. I thought I that that's was wrong. wrong. I think that's that's no. I mean, I disagree with these people uh, like vehemently. I don't. I, I, it drives me kind of crazy to be honest. Is that you know if you if there are war crimes in every side, right? Always this is there's not a, a, a conflict in history where this isn't true, and you know Americans came into a concentration camp in 1945 and machine gunned the guards. Um, I think it's the right thing to do, but they shouldn't have been. You know they need due process, right? We need to apply this fairly. So you see uh, Ukrainians. So I don't know if it's been verified committing some war crimes, pretty brutal stuff, shooting people in the knees and us. And it's on, oh, it's on all these Twitter feeds, all these people. That's when I get, get a little uneasy. You're not, you know, posting images from Bucha. You're not. You're just not doing it. Why are you doing this from one side? I mean, it's very important to denounce all this stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's bad. It's back to the culture war, right? Yes. Because yes. if you support Ukraine, yeah. you're supporting the latest thing. Mm -hmm. It means you were pro-vaccines. It means you're pro-abortion. You know, and if you're against the current thing, it means you are, you know, it's, it's, it, but I think this, again, this is a US thing. Yeah. It's a culture war thing. I have not really seen much in the UK where people are defending Russia or blaming uh, the West. I've not seen that, but I've seen a lot of it here. Yeah. And, and it, it was like, shit, we have to pick a side again. Well, the interesting thing is that I interviewed Stephen F. Cohen. Um, who passed away last year before the war started and John Mersheimer together, uh, the two kind of doyans of anti-war, not well, you know, realist foreign policy. And they were making these, I, it was incredible to see. And like, they were defending the arrest of Pussy Riot. That's, they'd gone so far, or particularly I think Stephen was of, you know, defending the actions of the regime, which is like, okay, now you're, 
you're transgressing that line. I mean, that's I, I, that was the Noam Chomsky thing that always bothered me. You can hate American foreign policy, but when you start defending the other guys who are probably worse, uh, just because you're so obsessed and kind of wrapped up in, in your hatred of American foreign policy, that's what gets to that point. I think what's interesting now is that it's not ideological in the sense that it used to be. The Cold War, it was the far left where Stephen Cohen was lived in the far left. And by the way, just in fairness, Stephen Cohen was a very, very good historian of Stalinism, but he was also a little too um, pro-Soviet for my taste. And but he, was, he was a good historian. I mean, give him credit for that. But he was a guy on the left. You know, the Nation magazine in America took a very particular line in the Soviet Union. Uh, and, you know, it's got better over the years, but they did, right? And then it was the right that was the, you know, the Cold Warriors. Now, it's kind of the anti-war right. It's, you know, I mean, I don't know where I'd put somebody like Scott Horton. And I wouldn't say that he's pro-Russia at all. And that's not, I don't get that from him at all. Oh, well, you think he's just an anti-war libertarian. Anti yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, that's a kind of confusing if he's a right or the left. I mean, he's just I mean, somebody who has principles and sticks to them. And, you know, I admire that. But there's, there's others, uh, I think, that are basing their reaction to this, th this series of foreign policy decisions. Um, on their domestic political agenda. Of course. Which is very troubling. If Trump had been re-elected yeah, yeah, yeah. and Trump was making the same decisions as Biden. I think we'd be in a different, having a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Very different conversation. But, but those, if they're, if they're, uh, it's one of these things I've talked about a bit recently. It's like, there's this massive criticism of mainstream media. Yeah. I've received personal attacks with people saying you just follow the mainstream narrative yeah. and there's some people who are contrarian to every mainstream narrative as a point of principle but, yeah. but if you do that you're you're going to be wrong on certain issues yeah you're a fucking idiot you're a fucking I mean, idiot that, yeah. you really are but but <laughs> I, but but we have had this growth of independent people who are kind of interesting and sure for sure but we also have the same problem some there's audience capture of someone i've been very critical of is tim paul who historically was i thought an interesting yeah. guy when he used to make his videos and Chernobyl and you know, Occupy. Wall Occupy. Street. It was kind of interesting. He was like, uh, yeah. he, he said he was a liberal, but I, I kind of had him down the middle. Yeah. He's just com been completely captured. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's cartoonish. It's yeah, cartoonish. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think I probably already I always had a negative view of him from stories that I that I heard from him back in the day. Oh, I didn't know, but I, I liked <laughs> yeah. his videos. Where, yeah. Where, yeah, his YouTube at one point was him making micro documentaries that were interesting. And then it became daily videos of commentary. And then he just was captured by by the right. Yeah. And, and by the way, I've seen this happen to a lot of people recently. It happens a lot. And that's not me being pejorative about the right. Sure. I think right have valid points or things I agree with and disagree with left and right. But he has been fully captured to the point where he has a single stream mm -hmm. of thinking which doesn't seem to have any balance at all. Yeah, I never go, I never understood this. I mean, think about it for a second. Why would it be that you have the same opinion as everybody else or, you know, you're a Republican or something, that you would have an opinion on war, guns, and abortion? Why would they all be the same? It doesn't make any sense to me. There's no, there's no ideological uniformity to those things. Um, you know, well, there's two are, reasons. Some are motivated by by religion, some by by broader ideology. But there is not a lot of sense to me that you know people on particular sides all have the same set of beliefs. It's always surprising to me that there's not not more deviation. Well, I, I think I think in their mind, I think it depends on the individual. I think in the minds of some people there is deviation. Yeah. But depending on their social standing, they can't deviate. Yeah, for sure. Like Ted Cruz cannot in any way say, "Hey." maybe we should have a chat about the Second Amendment. He can't do it. Yeah. So there's at that level. But then there's people who maybe have just got a small social media social standing, but they can't step out of their echo chamber because they'll be banished by the... Yeah, no, um, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of money to be made in this too, right? Yeah. There's, there's, well, there's, that's the other incentive. Yeah. But there is also the, um, I bring it up on the show all the time because I, I encourage everyone to read Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. It's a fantastic book. Unbelievable. And Jonathan book. is one of the smartest people out there too. And that gives, gives you a better, I think what that book does is gives you a reason to go, okay, you disagree yeah. with me, but I understand there's reasons why you disagree right. with me, and, yeah. and we let's have a conversation about yeah. that. It's kind of heartening that that book was so, was so influential to so many people, right? But not influential to enough people. Not to enough people. I mean, that's every book I've ever found influential. Like, I need more people to read this, and they, they don't. But Jonathan is right about that. I mean, the the we started this conversation about polarization, yeah. and I am somebody who believes that it's, it's not a problem that can be solved. It's, I mean, it's it's a fool's errand trying to correct this because the the corrections for this 
are always mildly authoritarian, right? I mean, what, so when you have these conversations, Tucker Carlson is responsible for the Buffalo shooting. This is what people are saying. I don't believe this at all. Uh-huh. Um, why, okay. are, why are they saying that, though? Because the guy who, the racist kid that shot these people was um, toying with the idea of replacement theory, um, which has a number of kind of iterations. I mean, just the, the most banal one is people saying that the demographics of a country change and therefore the voting patterns change. But, you know, as I was talking about Hispanic people, that's not entirely true. But people have those conversations. But that the other one is that, you know, the white race is being, being replaced, that kind of the racist version of that. Um, that was where he lived, right? And he was on 4chan and some weird subreddits and never mentioned Tucker Carlson in his manifesto, which was plagiarized from the Christchurch shooter. So it's that kind of universe, right? And uh, people decided to take this horrible tragedy and make some political points out of it. They hate Tucker Carlson. Um, We accused him of being a Kremlin stooge, et cetera. And uh, my question and response was, well, what do you plan on doing about this? So he says these things that might have, you know, was the spark plug for this kid's murderous rampages. I mean, this kid who, you know, murdered cats and put them in bags and like just a dis- disturbed children, a uh, disturbed child. What do you do? Well, we need to regulate speech is usually the response, right? I mean, there's nothing else you can do. It is regulation of speech. It is not, we need more free speech to counter this. It is always a regulatory response. So when people want to fight the culture war and change these kind of you know, little perverted incentives that come from bad actors or whatever. I don't want them to disappear because they're always going to exist. And, the, you know, a lot of people in the past have tried to make them disappear. And I can give you the names of countries and the time periods in which this happened. And it did not end well. Um, you know, speech code, you know, I, I think it's a very, di- people overstate the problem in the UK. But I do find it very scary that a police officer can shut up your door because of a tweet. That's not a good thing. Is it happening on a mass scale? No, it's not. But it, it, it happens enough that it's, it's I think, uh, unsettling. I mean, you're, you're aware I was in court two weeks ago. I was not. Okay, so um, I can't go into the details, but uh, yeah. I, I'm in litigation for 14 tweets. 14 tweets. Yeah, three-year litigation. Yeah, went it's, to a, it's a Twitter version of a mass murder. 14 I tweets. Know, I know. <laughs> but but it, it was having an opinion about something. and You can't even state the, what, what, what the, what the con- I mean, because the tw- tweets were public, presumably. The, tweet, the tweets are public. But you can't even mention what they were. It's best not to because we're, we're waiting. Over for, abundance of caution. Yeah, we've yeah, got, yeah, we're waiting for judgment from the judge. Yeah. But the point being is if you go and Google my name and litigation or trial, I'll find court, those. you'll find that and you'll yeah. see what I've said. Um, uh, I couldn't be sued for this in the US. No, thank God. But, but I am in that situation. Now, my, my, mine is a, a peculiar and has, like, there are scenarios where you, you could argue a similar thing that to what I've done could be libel. You could be. Is it political or personal? It's personal, personal which could have an economic political. effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but I understand, like, I think libel is a thing. Yeah. And I think you can destroy someone's life with false sure. accusations. Yeah. So I get it's a thing. I don't know how to deal with it. But in the UK, it's weaponized. Quite so you bit. can't say things. Like, for example, I, I can't say everything right now to you now, sat in a different country because I'm there is that caution, which also puts other people in a position where they can't make similar criticisms. So it puts people in a position where n- now, I am now in a position where I have to think about certain things I say because I can't risk litigation, which leads to bankruptcy. And I'm, a part of my job is that weird world where I'm half a kind of a podcaster, but there's a little bit of journalism. There's a journalist yeah, aspect yeah, to what sure. I do. Yeah. But my Journalistic freedoms restricted, which makes me aware that the the UK across the spectrum of news and media has restrictions because I know every one of these large media organizations will be off, always fearful of litigation. Mm-hmm. It's fucking terrible. Yeah, I mean, yours isn't, I presume, from the little that you've said, is not one of these examples of, um, you know, a British feminist who says a woman is a person that was born with a vagina, something like that. I mean, we've seen these things that have happened. It's not that, but it's not far off that. It's not far off from that. And I, so if you kind of 
reverse engineer the idea behind it. There's some idea of protection, right? We're protecting people from harmful speech. And that is, you know, a legacy of a lot of things in, in, in British law. But you can convince people of these things much easier now because they believe that speech is violence and nobody likes violence. I'm opposed to violence, right? There's a reason, a very specific reason that you recast words as violence because nobody wants to be opposed to free speech, right? Nobody was going to say, like, I don't agree with free speech. If you can find one of those people, they'll be very much an outlier, right? But if somebody says, well, I don't like violence, and I think doing violence to people, well, that changes things quite a bit, doesn't it? And when you do that in the US, there's, an, there's always, I mean, we talk about um, hate speech here. It was the same in the UK, we have hate speech laws. But you have laws, we don't. Yeah. But so we've taken the concept without the legal framework. So you socialized it. We socialized it, exactly right. In saying like, well, this is hate speech. I am, I'm opposed to hate speech. Well, I don't know what hate speech is. Is Ricky Gervais, making jokes, very funny special, by the way, um, is that hate speech? Well, they're jokes. Um, so it is that a separate category. Then you start wrestling with them in their own mud. And you don't want to do that because these are not people that are interested in a robust, honest debate. They're interested in winning. They're interested in winning. And how do you win? You cut off the other side. I want to protect the speech of the worst people on earth. I don't want David Irving to go to jail in Austria. I don't think that, you know, Holocaust denial laws have done anything. There are people that, you know, the runoff election in France that almost happens every French election is with Front National, whose founder was a Holocaust denier. And they do very, very well. You know, Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, minimized the Holocaust from the day he had a microphone in front of him. This stuff doesn't work. And actually, in fairness to that, yeah, it's uh, Marie Le Pen. Marie Le Pen, yeah. Um, she's, they've actually to try and become politically favorable and advance their position, she's had, actually had to become a little bit more tolerant. She's yes. had to you know, yeah. adjust, and, and it's better to do that for public opinion than through fear. Well, they do that for public opinion, and, and, and people say, well, look, it's, it's a success. But, you know, that's not how the person's going to govern, right? I no, mean, of course. It's just, it's just a bit of a public lie to make sure they don't end up in a docket. I mean, remember that Brigitte Bardot uh, ended up in a docket in is that is that that's a Bardot? Bridget, that's Bridget Look Bardot. at you, you fucking Islamophobe. Uh, she, <laughs> she, that's my know. favorite photo. But people listening won't realize yeah, yeah, I've yeah. got a Bridget Bardot tattoo. That's amazing. I didn't see yeah. that. Yeah. That so is, <laughs> I actually, I, and I have this as a large that's screen hilarious. print in my house because I, I could have chosen so many examples, but that one. Do you know this photo? Uh, the cigarette. In the yeah, mouth? yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like it's yeah. like one of my favorite photos ever taken. Yeah, it's from Breathless, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that she was uh, hauled into court because she said. Um, something about Islam. And I think about, because, you know, she's an animal rights activist, or something yeah. about halal slaughter or whatever it might be. But regardless of what it was, it didn't really matter. I mean, for her to be hauled into a court, this iconic French actress who's, you know, kind of inner dotage at this point, and they're bringing her into court. And I think it was maybe Michel Welbeck, who's, who was prosecuted too in France for saying Islam is the stupidest religion. Well, it's a set of beliefs. That's it. You can just say it's a stupid set of beliefs. That's fine. But to be prosecuted for that sort of thing, I, there are plenty of people in this country, um, I don't want to overplay their power, but there's plenty of people in this country that would love to see that sort of stuff implemented here. And I think every journalist um, should have been, you know, frothing at the mouth when people suggest these things. I mean, there was a guy named Carl Cameron, he used to be on Fox News. These ex-Fox News people do a lot of work to expunge their guilt, right? And he was on CNN and he said, you know, we need the government to intervene. And he's talking about Tucker Carlson, his, his former coworker. And they have to, and, and he said, people should, should be going to jail. He's a journalist. And the journalist host said, like, amen to that. I totally agree. You have two journalists on CNN talking about how another journalist, whether you you know, roll your eyes to that turn to apply to Tucker Carlson or not. He is one. We don't get to make those value judgments based on his opinions. And um, saying that he should be prosecuted and go to jail because of something that was not even mentioned in this crazy shooter's manifesto. Yeah, but it's like it's like blaming Quentin Tarantino. It's oh, yeah, the yeah, same, yeah, 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 It's exactly yeah. the same issue. It's no, it's there's so many people that I know in the, on, that are nominally on the left. This, you know, depresses me because this is a, you know, a world that... I like to inhabit in some ways. I'm a liberal person in a lot of ways. But they are, there's a lot of people that are taking up the Christian conservative mantle from the 70s and saying, you know, that 
this stuff has. And, and, and there's kind of an audience for it. And on the right, too, J.D. Vance today said that in an interview, I think this morning, that he was calling for a uh, full-scale ban on pornography. I mean, this is madness. Well, that's probably coming from the religious point. Yeah. For, for sure, for sure. But like, this is not something that even Christian conservatives campaigned on in the past 20 years. You'd be, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that was a contender in a Republican race who was of the Christian right that would make an issue out of banning pornography. But, you know, I think the atmosphere is such right now that people like talking about banning things. I like the opposite talk. I like the talk of liberalizing everything, letting people do and say what they want. And that's, you know, particularly when it comes to, you know, things that don't hurt other people. I mean, this is the basic sort of liberal principle, isn't it? Is that it doesn't hurt anybody around me, so please fuck off. I think that should be, you know, most people's kind of base instinct is please fuck off. Do not bother me because it's not bothering you. Pornography, whatever it might be. But it's a societal ill. This is like, that's the kind of Christian conservative version, a version of speech is violence, right? This is an unquantifiable thing. It's a societal ill. And this is why we're so, so I mean, off. I mean, uh, you know, look. It's, Crime is down, rape is down, all that stuff is down, by the way. But it's not, it's not so long ago, like, uh, I, I talked to my kids. I was like, oh, you guys, you don't know. There was yeah, a time yeah, where there was, time. there was no internet. You know, we had when to hear my daughter say fuck off at 11 years old. She's like, could you please stop telling me how things used to be? <laughs> yeah, I get it from my 12 year old. But, but, I, but I explained to them, like, there was a time there was no internet. Like, we had four channels on TV yeah. and we couldn't phone each other and we turned up yeah. for meetings on time. Like, you know, it, it was a different time. But back then, you know, maybe the news, maybe the news was even more propaganda, but it was a very small stream of information that we got that was from a certain number of TV channels two, you know, like six o'clock news maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like a certain number of papers. Yeah, and you yeah. knew they were p politically biased, but but there was a very s small stream of news. Now we're processing the opinions of thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world all coming in at real time. Yeah. We've just not, we've not acclimated to this. Yeah. Well, I think the also that the bad assumption is that when an opinion comes across the transom, that people are going to be affected by it. Um, because one of our favorite things to do is just to condescend to everybody because people in kind of mainstream media or people have been doing this for a long time. I shouldn't say mainstream, um, think everyone's a fucking moron, right? I mean, and this was sharpened so much in 2016. How could 60 odd million people vote for this sociopath? We, these people cannot be trusted. That was, I think the biggest long lasting damage of Trump was the kind of change in the mind of people that Americans did this. They can't be trusted, which okay, I can have that debate with you. I disagree with you. Whereas I think the more sensible conversation was how did it get to this point? Because that was a conversation people in the mainstream weren't willing to have. Because it did certainly turn the cameras on them a little bit, right? Is it people, you go out in the middle of the country and talk to them and they feel ignored, left behind, and very, very specifically condescended to. That was, that was probably the most common reaction when I asked people about this stuff. They say, you have contempt for us and you condescend to us. And people would call me fake news. I mean, I got this a million times. People wouldn't talk to me. And, you know, when the camera went off, they were nice. But they were like, you're going to fuck me over. Because you're going to tell me, that they're going to say that I'm racist and I'm this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And they're like, yep, but they all say that. And that was, that was literally the hardest part of reporting on this stuff in, in, in Trump times was getting people to. So I think this idea that Trump created this zombie, I think he definitely contributed to it, of everything's fake news. Yeah, he put a little phrase to it. A little catchy he branded phrase. it. He branded it. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, before, I mean, to, to think that people didn't think that before, I mean, good God. I mean, there's particularly now when you see, you know, uh, a guy I do the podcast with, we did a, a one for subscribers the other day. You should subscribe to the fifth column, by the way. Subscribe. Yeah, we the fifth dot subset dot com. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of traffic to get here. I got to be able to, to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was telling me that he watched the new uh, what Marvel movie, DC. I don't know these fucking things. And it was like, there was a woman named America Sancho Gonzalez or something. And she was from some planet where she has two mothers. And she has, like, this is, I mean, I'm, literally, I'm, literally, I'm literally going to a book party uh, for a book on gay, uh, the gay history of Washington, D.C. after this. I'm fine with it, but it's really, really strange that it's, they're trying so desperately to shoehorn it in. And, like, they, you know, have, a like, a, a 
trans pin on and all this stuff. And that, I think, is the thing that people are like, what the fuck is going on here? And they don't hate people at all. They don't. I mean, everyone, they have gay people in their family, but they just are like, why is this happening? <laughs> like, I just don't understand why everywhere I go, people are trying to retune my brand. It's like a carburetor. We're trying to get the mixture right of the fuel and the air until I get the right thoughts. And that's what happened after the BLM stuff, George Floyd, and everywhere you went, Amazon, everything. I mean, I was driving on Waze uh, uh, today. I drove from east of Long Island today. And there's little, I swear to God, there's little icons on, <laughs> on the map for women-owned businesses. And I'm like, yeah, but like, are they shitty businesses? <laughs> she could be a Nazi. I don't know, she's a woman Nazi. Is that, are they women who have the right politics? I don't know, but they're just like, like who the fuck is choosing? Nobody is choosing this. It's to assuage their own fucking guilt. You, do you know there's a, there's a downstream problem that that's caused? Yeah. I'll give you an example. So I um I did I made a film in El Salvador and spent a lot of time going around the country understanding and there's a there's a real issue Bitcoin with related. Yeah, yeah, but but I yeah. kind of stepped out of the Bitcoin thing. Just look yeah, at the yeah, real yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went um I went to like a, a facility which helps get addicts off the streets. Uh I I went to a concert that was quite a progressive concert. There was um um uh, trans groups there. I spent time with men, women, everything. Uh, I uh, spent one at a charity which helps get uh, uh, women who've been trapped in gangs and sex workers mm -hmm. off the streets. There's a real issue with the patriarchy and violence towards women there. Yes. Like a yes. genuine, yeah, real, absolutely, yeah. real issue yeah. that needs dealing with. Yeah. And when I interviewed Bikaley, I brought it up. I said to him, I said, you know, I asked him about the patriarchy and the issues and he replied, but today, um, you know, the, one of the comments comes up on YouTube. It's not the first one. There's been a, a few, and it's like, fuck you, McCormack, bringing up gender issues. I was like, well, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't me saying, let's have yes. women you know, own businesses yeah, yeah. <laughs> on ways. This is me saying, there's a yeah. significant issue with violence towards women. This, this should be talked about. Sure. It should be dealt with. Uh, of course. But the downstream of, of, yeah, all right. of the Ways app or those kind of things is causing people not to give a shit about real issues. I think that's very well put. I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's I, the the thing for me is that I have to do the throat clearing. Is that you know I was out debating pro gay marriage stuff, you know, before gay marriage became law in the U.S. I you know always have to do that and be like my position on this has been very clear and I am a, a left of the left on the on these issues. But it is the thing is like I'm not objecting to, you know, and I, I still don't really object to it. I haven't even seen the film, but mentioning that film. It's not objecting to the existence, it's exact, objecting to the reason, right? People feel that they have to shoehorn that into everything for themselves, right? It's, no one is going to watch this movie, even in a kind of drip, drip way over time and say, you know, I really didn't like gay people and now I do because of that Marvel movie. It's really about themselves. And I think you're absolutely right that when people start reacting to that, and I see this in the, you know, Tim Pools of the world, I'm not to pick on him or any specific example of them, people in that kind of universe in which all of this stuff is, you know, if somebody says, you know, a, a bill that has something to do with, you know, trans rights, broad, broadly speaking, you know, some of them aren't crazy, you know, <laughs> so it's like not, not, a, it's not a bad thing. Right. I mean, but you know, the read everything's the redefining of the woman has become, we have to fight this, you know, on the beaches in the air, we shall never surrender. You know, I mean, this is the, kind of crazy you know i mean yeah well yeah. the woke rea the, the reaction to wokeism is anti-wokeism which both yes. are fucking irritating and look i mean i blame if i were to have to put the blame somewhere which is not something you really have to do but if i were to say you know what is the etymology of this where did it start i would say it started with them <laughs> right i mean because the thing is is that i made this joke the other day on the podcast them, them being who's you know the kind of insane really over the top woke oh yeah people. of course yeah and it's like, you know, there's a counter reaction that you never expect and you probably should have. This is like the invasion of Iraq for me. It's like you maybe should have predicted that ISIS would come out of this and it wasn't going to be Berlin in 1948. You know, it's a flowering democracy. We didn't really foresee that, right? We, we should have. And people who make these arguments that are so kind of outside of the mainstream and they're like, well, fuck these people. They don't agree with me. It's just not the way of transforming a culture. It's the way of transforming a, a culture into a very hateful one, in one that is at loggerheads over every issue all the time. And I don't like living in that. You know, I don't like living in a culture where 
you know, whether it's on one end that I am fearful that the offense archaeology will get me. You know, somebody yeah. loves sifting through something you wrote uh, 20 years ago or something. I mean, Ricky Gervais's joke in that special, I don't know if you saw it, but was, you know, because it's social commentary and comedy. And they had a very funny joke about, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Hart being, you know, fired from the Oscars because of a tweet that he, he apologized for, like in 2011. Someone screenshot it, they put it up and, you know, he lost the job. And they asked him to apologize again. And he said, you know, I, you know, I already apologized. What do you want me to say? And Ricky Gervais made a very funny joke. That's a good point. And I'm going to do the joke great harm. But he basically said, like, who would have guessed that, you know, 10 years ago, there wouldn't have been a controversy because it wouldn't have been a controversy. Like, you know, a, a woman has a vagina and was born with a vagina. Like nobody would have, like, that's, that, no one said that because it wasn't a thing. It just wasn't controversial. But going back to that now might get you, and that's the thing, like this ex post facto thing of like, we have to go back and see, did you know then? Yeah. How come you didn't foresee what was going to happen? And some of that stuff is obviously not applicable if it's like, you know, genuinely hateful. But there's a lot of stuff that is kind of borderline. I mean, jokes, I I'll say a word now that you can, you, can, you can cut it and, you know, loop it and cancel me for it. When I was growing up, the word retard, because I grew up in Massachusetts and like yeah. everyone in America knows, like in the Boston action, they say retarded. That guy's fucking retarded. That was every, every person and nothing was documented. There are no phone cameras. But if you probably had me as a kid, that probably would have been said a lot. A lot. You have to future proof yourself. Now. I do. That's the problem. <laughs> Stop talking. Like just, just from from the moment of birth, you have to future proof <laughs> yourself for every scenario. It should be your next company, future proof, Fu future proof and humans. But you do, and it's fucking bullshit. Mm. And this is the problem. This is. I have think, you had anyone? I mean, because I imagine you're a, bit, a big, a big target. You know, you have a big following. Anyone uh, gone through your garbage and found anything of interest? Uh, yeah, I got I got a couple of well, I got a couple of recent ones through COVID um, because I once said um, it's now pandemic of the unvaccinated because at the time I'd read this article that said uh, most of the people coming into hospital are unvaccinated. Yeah, and and so I researched it a couple and I put that tweet out that keeps getting brought up. And also when I got my vaccine for a laugh, I decided to make a tinfoil hat. And I got the nurse to take a photo of me and I put it up and people are memeing <laughs> me with that. I mean, I've said stuff like that. The, the thing is, is... But by like, that first tweet isn't wrong. It, the, the, the people that were dying were unvaccinated. Well, no, but I know that. But Yeah. But the, well, what was the objection that people just transmitting it? Or? I think the, the objection to that is that it's the tweet is coercive towards people who should be getting a vaccine who don't want to. Mm -hmm. And that I think that's the point. And, and look... What I should, power you have. What, well, yeah, I know I don't. Um, what I should have done is quote tweeted it and said, yeah, yeah. this is an article I've read. I, I wonder if there's some value in it. But I I attributed the quote to myself by not, not quoting it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't think it through. I was pro-lockdown at the very start. I said, I am pro-archaic lockdowns because I was like, I was, it wasn't what was coming out of China. It was what was coming out of Italy. Yeah. Um, uh, and, so, and I think there's also, there's a clash between me having built this profile, but I'm British, European, I'm from yeah, England, yeah, 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 yeah. but the large majority of my audience is in the US. So I'm always on the left of everyone I pretty much meet yeah. within this audience. So like stuff happens, but like the thing is- like, But it hasn't, it hasn't pushed audiences away. I mean, you no. have an audience and, and you know, people are apparently fine with that, right? Well, yeah, because there is this, what is it, the 80% exhausted, the silent majority, yeah, whatever, yeah. who, you know, we get the emails from, they appreciate what I'm doing. I, I can't win against these people. I'm not going to flip who I am just, just to just be who they are. And I, I often say, I mean, Danny tells me to go off the Twitter comments, but when I, the, the YouTube, you them. the YouTube ones, I read some of them and then I just go and I say things like, like when they're really angry, I was like, well, just don't listen to my show. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, I see the world differently from you. Does it have any effect on you when you read that stuff? It has done, yeah. They're, they're, That's why I stopped. I don't. I, I, I don't. They're some, they're, somebody else approves them now. And I also I took I had a Twitter. Well, I actually had a very dramatic exit from Twitter. I was like, I'm done. Fuck this shit. Somebody said something about they're glad my mum was dying, and that was after some other bullshit. And I, it was if, if, anonymous account, I assume. Uh, no, it wasn't. And actually, some people chased him down and got him fired for it, which I didn't agree with. Yeah, I didn't yeah. agree with that. I mean, yeah. it was an awful thing, but. You know, Danny is my. Do you agree with Do you agree with it being public though, in the sense that people retweet it or whatever and say this is who this person is? I, I support that. Don't be a rat and go to their job because that's a speech. Yeah. But yeah. like, 
don't you know don't get him ratted out for his. I don't. I'm, he yeah. his soul has to live with the fact that he's. Did he apologize to you? No, he didn't. He actually tweeted again. But he he. He has, his soul has to live with the fact that he's a fucking what loser. A piece of shit. That yeah, he's, just, he's like, <laughs> and when when you find out, found out the job you're sacked from, I was like, well, you're just a fucking loser. You've got a shit job. You live in a shit place, and life isn't good for you. So you're you're punching up and whatever. Yeah. But Danny is my producer, but he's my therapist and my counselor and my oh, advisor. And and when I we, I we hope have, he pays you well. We have don't take it in Bitcoin. <laughs> we have we, we have a we have a phone call every morning, pretty much when he's in Oz and I'm in the UK and. We have a talk, and when I'm struggling, I say, look, I'm really fucking pissed off. I'm getting all this shit. And then so I had this dramatic exit. I was like, I'm fucking done with this. Fuck Twitter. Fuck you. And get on. And you know what? I had a great month, but I missed it. You did. And I, the way I explained it, it's like when you go to a party, but you're driving, you can't drink, and everyone's getting drunk, and you're like, oh, fuck, they're all having fun. Mm -hmm. And I kind of missed it. But I also missed the point that I, I think I'm a little bit contrarian in the Bitcoin land because I am a... British uh, person who's willing to have opinions that don't fit in with the standard Bitcoin kind of views that some people have. I was like, do you know what? It's actually probably useful. Like, yeah, you know, I might really fuck these people off. I might really trigger them, but at least I'm out there just saying something's alternative and different. I'm bringing pe different people on the show who maybe aren't right or from the le uh, or for, or libertarian. So. You know, I felt like I maybe have a duty to, so I came back and started triggering people again. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I've had people try to counsel me in a range. Of, I mean, I had one very popular writer of a uh, very what is seen as the most popular book in Bitcoin, um, who tried to counsel me, uh, and he's you know this very not the kind of thing he you would expect him to do. We had a minor disagreement. I compared his views on modern art to the Nazis on Twitter. <laughs> He he wrote to all my sponsors. Yeah, yeah. He wrote to all my sponsors. I was I was wondering what the hinge moment was. Like I compared it with Nazi. You know, he doesn't like modern art. He calls it degenerate art. So I he actually used the phrase degenerate art. Yeah, he used degenerate art. I'm that's sure. literally a Nazi phrase. Yeah, I mean, Entartete der Kunst, as they say in German. Wow, that's are you serious? Yeah, the Museum of Degenerate Art. <laughs> so I I might have made a, a comment on Twitter that said, I mean, the, how do you not make the Nazi reference? Good well, lord. So I mean, I, I just said, look, the last people to. Uh, refer to modern art as yes. degenerate art was the Nazis. He was offended by this, and he wrote to all my sponsors, essentially threatening them if they carried on sponsoring me, which was fucking ridiculous. I mean, this is a guy whose book and life and career is about censorship-resistant money, but is so weak in his own views and is so weak with regards to you know, opinion and free speech that he tried to censor me. I mean, it's complete hypocrisy. There's something amazing about it in this kind of universe that we live in, that you had a potential run-in with cancellation, um, a Bitcoin guy who does a Bitcoin podcast, and another Bitcoin guy who wrote one of the most popular, and it was about art. Uh, is it, I mean, it's it, fucking insane. I mean, this is art itself. No, and it is, it is like performance art, because it, it is, it shows you in, in some sense the, the rot and how, like, you know, would people have done the sponsor thing, you know, 15 years ago, if there was an internet, it was not social media internet, and you had an online thing, or you even had a print magazine, would they write to your sponsors? No. I mean, this is something that has been proven effective because companies are skittish, and they don't want to, like, oh, that might be bad. Let's just, it's best not to do it. We don't want to be on the wrong side of that. I mean, the, the corporate um, response to this stuff has been really uh, alarming. Well, mine, mine was great because these sponsors. They said fuck you. Yeah, yeah they're like fuck. Well, one, one, one said like literal fuck you. The other, we had to have a call. And I was like, look, well, if you want to cancel me, cancel me. And they're like, no, we're not going to. But like, is there a way you two can get on? And like, I saw this guy again at a conference. By the way, I think he's in the wrong. Mm -hmm. But I saw him and I went, should we forget about it? Yeah, and he shook my hand. A few weeks later, he's fucking slagging me off on Twitter again, which is fine. That's your free speech. That's your whatever. But that's just like, how can you be out there and build your career? on Bitcoin, but try and censor someone because they disagree with you. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, that just seems to be contrary to the nature of, of why one would be involved in I, I, Yeah, but the sad, the sad thing is, uh, I've never talked about this publicly, yeah. like to this level. And the sad thing is, is like, I know Danny's going to be thinking, Pete, maybe we should cut this. And, Don't cut it. But the point being is that if it becomes public or people discuss it, there will be a group of people who will still side with him, whatever. Yeah. Because... He fits in their ideology, and I don't. And he's a sort of libertarian type? 
Is that in his uh, kind of? Uh, that's the kind of default. I, I don't imagine. know. Yeah. I mean, he certainly talks like a libertarian. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Is he a libertarian? It's a hard one. Yeah, yeah. But he's very much does not trust government. Uh, anti-COVID lockdowns, anti-mandates, anti uh, anything that probably comes from the government or, or central place. Yeah, he certainly doesn't believe with like in the government structures we have today. But he likes like um, yeah, he's an ar- monarchy capitalist. And, yeah. yeah, you know, he likes yeah. monarchies. Oh, he's a yeah Curtis Yarvin type. Yeah. yeah, I don't think he believes in dinosaurs as well. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but you're 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 giving me an honest accounting of this. You said that is Nazi phraseology when you say degenerate art, and that was actually. The thing. Yeah. But th- there was background to this, though. Like, so the background to this was... Did you sleep with his wife or something? No, no, no. no. The background that to this great. started from... I, put out, <laughs> I left out this detail. I've been fucking his wife for six months. No, I put out this tweet <laughs> once. I was like, you're an idiot if you don't think humans cause climate change. You're an idiot. Like, like yeah. I never named him. I just put that. And he came up in my DMs and, and said, you're fucking... He called me a retard, actually. He was like, you're a retard. People like you shouldn't have a platform. Shut the... F-. Like, he just losing his shit. And then he blocked me. And I saw him at another conference and I was like, hey man, well, listen, look, and look by the way, I'm British, right? Mm-hmm. You, you fall out with someone, yeah. you just go up, shake hands, and say, let's have a beer, forget yeah, about it. Yeah. So I, was, I went up to him <laughs> and said, and I was like, hey man, uh, we're kind of on the same team here with this Bitcoin thing. Can we just accept like we think about uh, uh, climate change differently, but like still be friends? He's like, yeah, yeah. So we shook hands. And then like two weeks later, he's like slagging me off on Twitter. So I was like, well, fuck this. And that's when I said, uh, I called him a batshit crazy psychopath. And it seems, a, I mean, that seems like a, a reasonable I thought statement. It was fair. I mean, I, I can't imagine getting that exercised about climate change if you're not a climate change scientist and you write about Bitcoin. But I don't know. I mean, it's a tribal thing, I guess, that you're not in the tribe. And, you know, everybody outside of the tribe is an enemy, I guess. I don't know. I, don't, I see these people, I don't interact with them much anymore because yeah. I used to be the person who mixed it up. And then I realized it was bad for my mental health and probably my physical health too because it just i would get so pissed off at, at this stuff and nothing um it doesn't matter it like it re- it could be you know an egg a twitter egg and i would be annoyed and have the instinct to respond and of course every single person in my life was like what is it man some random person they have 40 followers and I'm like, yeah, but some it's out there and somebody could find it and i need to tell them that it's wrong you know it's like that yeah. new yorker cartoon like the you know come to bed and he's like, no, sorry, honey, there's somebody who's wrong on the internet. It's like, that is like me. I, I couldn't do it. So I backed away from Twitter and I don't feel like I'm an obligation to any of the people that follow me on Twitter. It's like they fucking pay me. I mean, it's like I, so I don't tweet very much. And then once in a while when I do, people are like, oh, wow, you're coming out of your your shell again. But it's the, the, the combat I, I am not interested in because I, we get them on the podcast. And then it's a totally different thing. I mean, do it both. I want I want them to come and try to punch me in the face. I want them to spit at me because I want the same persona because I think it's though. absolute cowardice when people are, you know, talk this tough game and then come on the show and are just like, oh, hey, how's it going? It's like, no, no, do it. But the, but that's the, that's the point. And that's why I'm a big fan of this. And that's why I support it. Yeah. That's why Danny always says, listen, Pete, just do it in the show. That's, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Should, you know, have, you, have you thought about having this guy on the show? He, he he could come on tomorrow. And I'd have the conversation. He's been on with him. in the past before the before yeah. the incident. Yeah, before Listen, the Nazi incident. Twice now, the wife twi- Twice now, I've gone up to him and said, "Hey, let's forget about it." Actually, three yeah. times, and then three times, to- and three times he's shook my hand, and afterwards he's done it. And like so be it. I mean, I just think it's weak character. It's not it's not how we do do things in the UK, but it is what it is. If he wanted is he, to come, is he American? No. This isn't the worst thing that's happened to me. There's like literally, I can think of one person in life who's been in my life who I would never shake his hand and be friends again with because he fucked my wife. That's literally the only person. Oh, is that I, actually true? No, not this guy. Oh, I'm saying, oh. I'm just saying the only person in my life is that like. Yeah. You don't yeah, want to shake that person. Yeah, fuck that now. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah fucking funny. get hit by a truck. But yeah. anyone else, like, I don't care. Like, I've, I've fallen out with people, all kinds of shit. Forget about it. Like, life's yeah. too short. If he wants to get into schools, let's forget about it. Let's Did go I, fight for Bitcoin. I hope that I didn't provoke you to talk about the wife thing and you've talked about that publicly before. Oh, I've talked about that publicly okay. before. Okay, I didn't yeah. know. I was going to think that was an incredible victory for my mm-hmm. counter-interviewing style. No, no. I mean, he just told me somebody was working with wife. Yeah. Okay, so that's public. Yeah, that's public. You talked about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People know about that. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm a cuck. But. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, look, yeah, I, but these, 
the, that doesn't matter because the the uh, the downstream thing of that is I've got this whole new career because my life changed and yeah. like I'm, I'm okay with that. Life Wait, that was not, a result of your life falling apart. Yeah, my, my basically my marriage broke up very quickly. Yeah, um, uh, I developed a drug and drinking problem. What type of drugs? Cocaine. Yeah, um, it's always the good one. It was. Yeah, it's I, great. I mean, I have to say, I mean, it's I avoid it now. Yeah, because it's all fentanyl and all that. But you know, I mean, it's the one if you're gonna get. Hooked on something. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I'm, I'm nine kids years. Kids don't do it. It's bad, but you know, it's it's not heroin. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, but I'm nine years clean. I'm glad it's over <laughs> me. But like, life collapsed. Yeah, my advertising agency collapsed because I wasn't going to work. And then I end up taking a year off work. I end up on a uh, retreat in Italy run by Rich Roll, uh, vegan ultra athlete. Wait, wait, wait. You? I'm sitting across from you. Yeah. You've done very well in Bitcoin. You're known in this world. You're a big guy with tattoos. And you're describing an eat, pray, love scenario where you went on a retreat after your life falling apart. Well, it's all linked. So what happened was I take a year off work. My mom gets cancer and she's oh God, yeah, very year. sick. She goes vegan as one of the recommendations. So I was like, oh, I'll do that with you. Uh, uh, she, um, um, yeah, I'm traveling across the know, I'm vegan with her and I'm, trying to get I'm, I'm off the cocaine but i'm trying to get my get rid of my anxiety so i go running every day and then end up discovering this podcast by rich roll who's a vegan ultra athlete so um so i'm going running every day and i'm listening to, i'm just going through all his back podcasts which are either about running or meditation or yoga or veganism and i'm just listening to it every day and it turns out is this retreat in italy and this is not stuff you were interested in previously. No, I didn't give a fuck. Yoga and things like no, that. No, I didn't give a shit. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I did yoga, meditation, and running to get rid of panic attacks. I was having severe panic attacks and anxiety. Anyway, so I end up in Italy, and you know, I'm hanging out with him and all the other people on this retreat. And uh, and at the end of it, he's like, he does a one-to-one -one session with everyone. And, you know, and I assume he said to any, everyone, but he's like, if you're ever in um, uh, LA, like, look me up. So anyway, I get back to the UK, I'm like, Fuck it, I'm going. So I like booked a flight to LA. My friend was living there, Justin. So I went to stay with him and I was like, oh, hi, Rich, I'm here. <laughs> went over his house. And then, like, a few days later, I was like, look, I like your job. I've got no career at the moment. I think I want to be a podcaster. I just bought some Bitcoin to buy cannabis oil for my mother off the dark web. So that's how I discovered Bitcoin. He was like, well, this is how you start a podcast. Uh, Send me uh, an equipment list. I order it all off Amazon. And then I contact this guy, Luke Martin, who I mentioned earlier before we yeah. started. And I was like, hey, I'm about to launch a podcast. Do you want to be the first guest? That was November 17th, 2017. And then here we are, four and a half years later. I've done 510 episodes. I've interviewed the president of El Salvador twice and started making films. It's like, it's such an unbelievable set of circumstances. So really, the guy who fucked my wife, I'm like, thank you. He you made like, you a wealthy man. He made, yeah, yeah. He changed my life. And he actually got rid of something that you didn't want around anyway your wife uh, not, well she's yeah, I know, yeah but i'm just know. saying but yeah that's, but like I, I mean i don't get too deep into it but i'm just saying no. probably there's some old other silver linings here. It, the, this you know you know it was shit for my kids but the silver lining is i've got this incredible life i've got this new friend danny who i'd never have met this new friend jeremy we travel the world we make this podcast it's not a job really i get to make films i've been to 40 50 countries all out of that retreat all, no, all out of a chain of events, which includes an affair, a drug addiction, a mother being sick. Like all those things had to happen for me to be in the scenario here. Because that if my if the affair doesn't happen, I don't quit my job. Yeah. Well, I don't quit the advertising industry. If my mother doesn't get sick, I don't end up buying Bitcoin to buy um, to buy a cannabis oil. And, and my mother mother doesn't get sick, I don't uh, go v uh, vegan with her, so I don't discover rich roll. So all those things conspired to me ended up being at this retreat. It's a memoir, you know. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, yeah. I mean, if I get successful no, no, enough, no, anyone cares. No, no, in some ways. It's a memoir. I mean, you pitch that to a publisher and it's a memoir. Okay. I mean, I mean it's, it's not only just an amazing turn of events. It's, you know, it has all the lessons in it. And that's what people need when they're in situations like you were in. You found it in a podcast. Other people find it in other people's stories. I mean, that's what I did in similar circumstances. People, you look and you seek out people that have had catastrophes like you, but you get to the end of their story when you're in the middle of your journey. Yeah. You know, as Lionel Trilling said, the middle of the journey, which it's a horrible place. But when you can get to the end of somebody else's, it mitigates all the bits in the middle. So it's probably worthwhile to actually write about it. Maybe, maybe one day. Well, listen, look, this is... 
Can I sell it for you? I'll just you be your agent. You, you can be my agent. So, there is one other thing I want to ask you about because you brought it up. I've written down one note. You mentioned going to Venezuela. I went to Venezuela. So oh, yeah, I just yeah, yeah. want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I went during the Maduro. During Maduro, Maduro yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. I mean, I loved the country. It's a great country. Yeah. People are amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. I went yeah. to the border at Cucatar. It's where I made my first film. It's a bit shit, the film, but... Um, first one always is. Yeah, but I went to Cucatar at the border where people are streaming across, and then I went into Venezuela. I saw East and West Caracas, how mm -hmm. they're completely different. Yeah. Uh, I saw how people are completely brainwashed for a dictator, like yeah. how you can be actually brainwashed for a dictator. But I met an amazing group of people, and I just fucking loved it, and I want to go back. It's I'm not allowed to go back, um, I think for multiple reasons, but Americans... I think now are not allowed. They don't give journalist visas uh, anymore. And, you know, there was a small tourism in industry in Margarita Island and places like that. Actually, when I was leaving, I was uh, checking into the, uh, to the, uh, to the plane behind John Lithgow, who I was coming from, I think, a vacation in Margarita Island. But yeah, it used to be a place where we, where we don't, we can't go now. And there's all these, you know, the back and forth that Americans do very well with, you know, Cuba and Venezuela and just totally pointless bans on travel. But um, yeah, I have been obsessed with the country since Chavez uh, took power, uh, made a lot of Venezuelan friends, um, very close friends and people in, in interesting positions, many of whom have left the country. Um, some that are still there, uh, one in particular, and I've been talking, uh, not talking about this publicly, talking to somebody else about doing a, a kind of narrative podcast about, about one particular fascinating figure in Venezuela who's known to some people, but not known to many, but he's a very in influential player because, you know, it's a country like that in the, you know, you know, the language of Chavismo, which was yeah. just, you know, boring, you know, liberation theology. That was the kind of, you know, and you saw that in oh, El Salvador and all that stuff is, you know, half religious and half Marxist. Uh, it became what they always do. It's like, we can't, we don't need to have this debate anymore. It ends in an oligarchy of very rich bully bourgeoisie, as they call them, the Bolivarian bourgeoisie. And, you know, they just opened a Ferrari dealership, I think a couple of weeks ago in, um, in uh, Caracas. In, <laughs> no, no joke. It's like, this is like a place where the, and, and the mistake that people make is to think that Chavismo was fine and Maduro killed it. Uh, Chavez made a hash of the country, uh, destroyed it. And then Maduro turned it up a notch, destroyed it even more, and then actually started arresting people. Where Chavez was a little more selective. It was a, a judge named Maria Afune, like did some little things here and there and shut down newspapers and shut down. It, and they didn't, it was a uniquely kind of interesting thing of like, let's not do it like the old thing. We won't renew their broadcast license, like RCTV. They didn't renew that because they have to have a license, right? Every country does that. Won't renew it. So we didn't shut them down. We just didn't renew their license, you know, that kind of thing. And then it became more and more authoritarian. And it's a tragedy because, I mean, it was the richest country in South America, incredibly advanced in the 60s and 70s. Of course, never had a good government, but that's, you know, a kind of endemic thing in the, in the, in the region. But to watch a country that has the largest proven oil reserves outside of Saudi Arabia, that heavy crude in the Orinoco Basin, have to send it to America to be refined because they fired everybody at the state uh, PDVSA, the state oil company, because they were protesting Chavez and they were they were going on strike. And, you know, it's a lefty regime that's, you know, essentially a labor union. I mean, people were striking and they fired them all and replaced them with sycophants and the country collapsed. You know, and you're right. I mean, like, this is the thing. Putin, see, we end this on this Putin thing, too, is that you ride high on, on oil. It's $140 a barrel. You know, it never, they're like professional athletes in America who, you know, get a $30 million contract, they spend it all in one year and they hurt their knee and they never play again and they're broke. They spent, they, they, they lived like they were going to get $30 million every year. And in the case of Venezuela, oil price is always going to be high. And it was, and that's it. It's the only part of the economy that, that, that was even, that was barely functioning, but that's where all the money came from. Yeah. And then it collapses and, you all know. these state employees. Yeah, I mean, it is wild and th the slums there are, Super depressing. Yeah. Um, we made a film uh, there, uh, which I was actually a producer on. I mean, I've been a host for a long time, but this one, uh, one I produced uh, with my old friend Ryan Duffy um, about murders in Venezuela and came out in 2012. And they had, I think, 20,000 murders that year. America, a country of 340 million people, had, I think, 13,000 that year. They had 20,000 in their country of 30 million. And the government had stopped counting them 
stop releasing numbers because rather than fix it. And so there were journalists would go to the one morgue in Caracas and count the bodies as they came in during the day. And that's how they would get a tabulation of, of, um, of how many people were being killed. But it was, we went out we right along to the police and it's just like to see a country that used to be so mighty and of such wealth just descend into lawlessness, violence, and, you know, political extremism, which is essentially um, what happened, you know? And it's, but it's a great country. I love it. We, we went into the barriers as part of my uh, documentary. And uh, this is me being a naive wannabe journalist went along with just some guy in his van, went yeah. in and did our interviews and left. And I said to the guy afterwards, I was like, should we have probably had security? It's like, yeah, we probably should have. And like, there's a lot of kidnappings around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sequoia Express. Yeah. They, they kidnap you and try to get money within like a day. And yeah. If not, they kill you. Yeah. And, you know, it's the only um, Latin, uh, uh, South American country that plays baseball because of American involvement in the oil industry. And there's a lot of professional baseball players in Venezuela. And, you know, they're... Mothers get kidnapped. They get kidnapped because they have money, you know? I mean, Ugi Urbina, relief pitcher, his mother was kidnapped, I think maybe twice, mm. or he was kidnapped and she was, I mean, but it's, it, that's the economy of the, of, the, of the country in so many ways. But it's depressing, but I, but I, you know, better days ahead, but I've been saying that for 20 years and nothing's happened, so. Well, listen, look, uh, not the interview I thought we would do, loved no. it. Uh, I hope we do this again. I do too. I, really, I would, really love, enjoyed I would it. love it. This is great. Yeah. great com fantastic. I like meandering conversations. Yeah, me too, man. Because otherwise... It's did boring. we talk about Bitcoin? Yeah, we did. We talked a little bit about yeah. Bitcoin. We can get away with that. Yeah, we, we're, we're fine. I, I, I don't have a ton, but it's it. I'm, I'm sad now. That's what I'm going to say. We all have I, that story. I have sadness. I have profound sadness. And much like uh, internet comments, do you know what I did? I deleted all of the apps that give me price alerts. <laughs> I just leave them because if, if if I don't see it, it's not happening. Uh, right? We're still early, man. I, you, you, you're one of those guys. You're, you're going to tell guys. me I'm, I'm, everything's cool and I'm, everything's fine? Yeah, we'll see, man. <laughs> well, anyway, listen, look, thank you don't for coming on. Uh, it's called The Fifth Column. The Fifth Column, yeah. Check out The yeah, Fifth Column podcast. And yeah, I hope we do this again, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.